Welcome to a brand new episode of Citizen Detective. I'm one of your hosts, Mike Morford. My friends call me Morph. I host or co-host several true crime podcasts, including Criminology, The Murder of My Family, Missing Persons, and Zodiac Speaking. And before we get started, just want to let everyone know, as usual, if you have a voicemail you'd like to leave about the show or about the case we we're discussing or any of the other cases we've discussed, you can do so by going to speakpipe.com slash citizen detective and one other thing if you want to know anything about the show what's going on news catch old episodes you can go over to citizen detective podcast.com and with that i'm going to turn you over to alex thanks morph i'm alex ralph researcher and writer for citizen detective and i also work on various other projects with the doc I'm just a law grad with about 15 years experience in criminal law. I've worked both prosecution and defense in homicide cases and other violent crimes. I always have to let you guys know where you can find us. We record live on YouTube, twitch.tv slash citizen detective, twitter.com slash citizen pod and facebook.com slash citizen detective. Lee? I am Dr. Lee Murder. Oops, I mean Meller, Dr. Murder, either way. I'm the author of seven books. I have a uh, former vice president and head of behavioral for the American investigative society of cold cases. My show is murder was the case available exclusively on Patreon, where I'd like to direct you to become a member of the DDA, the digital detective agency. What's that? That's like the inner circle of citizen detective. And um, you get access to the scrum, which is our after hours. And hopefully as the show develops, we'll be putting out more for the DDA. But once again, that's patreon.com slash citizen detective. Before we go ahead with today's case, Alex, we have something uh, we want to address, right? Yes, we do. We want to go back to West Memphis, our last episode. And there was um, a discrepancy between the information we found and what our guest Bob Ruff said, and that had to do with head injuries in the cases. And he said, if you all remember, that only one of the boys, I believe it was Michael Moore, had skull fractures. But my research showed that all three boys did. So the next morning I went back and I found the autopsy reports and I found the original ones what I had discussed looks, going back, it looks like it was a transcription of the autopsy reports. So I went to the originals and what I did get wrong was the locations. But in fact, all three boys had skull fractures. Um, I'm looking at Steve Branches right now. And it says here, and I quote, the base of the skull showed a three and a half inch fracture with multiple extension fractures, which terminate and a bunch of Latin. Um, and the left posterior cerebral hemisphere showed multifocal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Then also, let's see, Christopher Byers autopsy report says um, in the left posterior cranial fossa was a fracture measuring three and a half inches in length uh, with radiating fractures in the left cranial area. And the brain also there showed multifocal subarachnoid hemorrhage. And so, yeah. Okay. What we found after, after I looked this up to check, because we, I think we were all kind of stopped up short. 
with the analysis? Yeah, well, changed, because that, I, I came that. in with an understanding that all the boys were beaten and that they that had had injuries. But then when Bob, who has like been researching the case for years, said that they hadn't, I was like, well, you know, I haven't spent as much time on it as him. We must be off. Um, but I did give an original analysis before um, Bob came in and said there was no head injuries. So mm -hmm. you can go back and check from there. But we just wanted to clarify because uh, it kind of stopped us in our tracks a bit. But no, it's bit. it's what you'd think. Of course, they would have head injuries. You know, that's right. how you control three boys. You beat the shit out of them. Mm -hmm. And I believe we also have a comment from a viewer listener that. Oh, my. Yeah. I'll read this. I got the good eyes. Um, OK, here's my theory of this case. I believe that the boys were assaulted at a home and dumped at that side by someone who was familiar with the area and had a small window of time to get rid of them. I think they were completely stripped for either of two reasons or both reasons. Lee, did we lose you? I think we may have lost Lee. So I'll, I'll go ahead and take over. Okay. Um, so uh, you picking up where Lee left off. One, to punish and humiliate them. Two, to keep fiber evidence out of the perpetrator's vehicle. I do not believe this was a sex crime. I believe they were killed by an adult male that was very close to them. This narrows down the pool of suspects to about two people. I think this person used the cover of searching to dispose of the boys' bodies and bicycles. The bicycles are key. If they were left at the pipe when the kids went into the wooded area, why didn't anyone see them? Also, the boys said they were running away. If they were running away, why would they abandon their bicycles and go into the wooded area to begin with? I believe the killer brought the bikes to the pipe late that night and threw them in the bayou. The boys had no mosquito bites and none of their footprints were found at the site where their bodies were discovered. The geography is important here. I believe that the killer put the incapacitated, tied up boys in his car, put their clothes in a trash bag and drove around behind the truck wash. At the time, the cars could drive behind the car wash within a few feet of the woods and be completely hidden from the highway. He could make sure the coast was clear and make and take them to about 20 steps to the ditch and put them in and push the clothes in the mud all in about five minutes. And he has the perfect excuse if anyone sees him leaving the woods. He was searching for the boys. There is only one person whose time is unaccounted for that night who was also close to the victims and had a reason to conceal the bodies and bicycles. Um, so we discussed a lot of theories. We discussed a lot of possibilities. And in this case, who knows, maybe maybe he's on to something. You know, I would say that you just not to dwell on this case for too long since we're covering Mr. Cruel tonight. But, uh, you know, one thing I remember discussing are these witnesses that saw them together the boys in that general time timeline leading up to them going uh missing so it, it and you know you can watch the bob ruff documentary which i rewatched too and they interview these couple couple witnesses that say in that time frame where they believe they were killed they see these boys riding together sort of in a group um so that would kind of maybe put a you know you know, wouldn't allow for that theory that we just read out to to be possible. But again, who knows? It's definitely worth considering. And that's why we like hearing from people to hear these different theories. And, yeah. you know, they're worth talking about. So with that, are we ready to dive into this episode? Let's do it. OK, so All this right. is. The, OK, good. Right. So we're going to dive in. Uh, this is the case of Mr. Cruel, as I mentioned. Mr. Cruel was the name given to a serial child rapist and murderer who terrorized sub suburban children in Melbourne, Australia, between 1987 and 1991. There were four official attacks, beginning with the rape of an 11-year-old girl in her home and ending in the abduction and murder of a teenage student. Mr. Cruel spent considerable time learning about his victims, silently stalking them until he was ready to attack. He brazenly entered homes and took extensive measures to conceal his identity. A special task force was assembled to investigate the cases, rounding up 27,000 persons of interest, but never making an arrest. Currently, police have seven individuals on their list of viable suspects. This list includes a retired university prof professor with an extensive history of rape. 
since we do not have a case file or access to any official reports, our research into Mr. Krull relies on secondary sources. These sources differ in terms of some details, and we'll do our best to sort them out tonight. Doug McGregor is back tonight with us. He worked on the Mr. Krull case and brings his insights into the geographic investigation. And of course, retired homicide detective and author Cloyd Steiger is with us to give his take on the victims and the perpetrator in the investigation. And Susanna is traveling today, but will try to join us if she can. So with that, let's dive into this case. Australia is home to the best surfing in the world, the Great Barrier Reef and the remote and arid inland area known as the Outback. Because Australia sits south of the equator, their seasons are the opposite of those on the northern side. Australian summer from December to February and winter lasts from June to August. In September and November, when we're watching the leaves fall from the trees, Australia blooms with the promise of spring. Melbourne is the coastal capital of the state of Victoria. For seven straight years, Melbourne held the title of most livable city and is considered the sporting capital of the world. Despite its reputation as a safe place for families to raise children, Melbourne served as the hunting ground of the continent's most notori notorious child rapist and murderer. The identity of Mr. Krull's first victim has never been made public. We know that she was 11 years old, although one news report put her at 12. And she lived with her parents and one sibling in the eastern suburbs of Lower Plenty. On Saturday, August 22, 1987, a man entered the victim's home around 4 a.m. Some reports state that the intruder broke a front window to gain entry, while others state that he removed the pane of glass altogether. According to Unsolved Casebook, the man slipped through the house and cut the phone lines. Fully prepared for an attack on the family, the invader woke the victim's parents and made them lie on their stomachs while he handcuffed their hands and ankles. According to the site, Who is Mr. Cruel? He told the parents, be quiet and don't move or I'll hurt someone. His target shared a bedroom with her seven-year-old brother. According to an April 2009 episode of Australian Crime Stories, the intruder entered the children's rooms next and tied the victim's brother to the bed. According to Who is Mr. Cruel, however, he roused the children and took them to the parents' bedroom. He switched the parents' handcuffs to nylon cord, tied the boy to the bed, and tied the daughter's hands. He used electrical tape to gag each family member and surgical tape to blindfold the children. The intruder told the family he was there to rob them. He demanded cash, a first aid kit, clothes, a shower and a shave, and some food. He asked the father how much money was in the house and what size clothes he wore, commenting that they were about the same size. The father reported that the attacker's voice was gruff, deep, nervous, and he sounded uneducated. He ordered the victim's parents and brother into a cupboard or a closet where he covered them with a blanket, shut the door, and secured it with a shoe rack. Family members heard him making a call from the bedroom phone where he called the recipient Bozo and threatened their children. As we discussed, some reports state that the intruder previously cut the phone lines in the house. Others claim the police looked at the family's phone records and found no outgoing calls during the time in question. Whatever the case, police believe that the call was a red herring. After he secured the family to his liking, the intruder brought a radio into the room and turned it to the station 3KZ. He turned the volume up loudly, then took the daughter to the bathroom. He asked the daughter questions like, what's your name and how old are you? The girl replied, but the attacker either didn't listen or he didn't care, calling her Kate by mistake. Over the next two hours, Mr. Krull raped and sexually assaulted the child. When he was done, the assailant made her brush her teeth and bathe. After, he went into the kitchen where he helped himself to cold lamb, biscuits, milk, and orange juice. When he finished his meal, he took the girl into the living room, raped her again, and dumped her in a chair. Australian Crime Stories spoke with the victim off screen, and she told them that at some point during the assault, the man said, my liberty, my freedom is more important than your life. Mr. Krull returned to the master bedroom to check on the rest of the family, then came back and took the daughter to another room. There, he tied her ankles together with nylon cord and made her sit in a chair or other type of seat. He told her he was leaving and to count, one, count to 100 before she re released her parents. Before he left, he picked up the glass from the window and ripped the telephone from the wall. This may or may not comport with reports of the cut phone lines. 
When the daughter heard the front door shut behind him, she ran to the master bedroom and freed her family. The time was about 6 a.m. The rapist stole money, jewelry, and clothing from the family. He took $250 in cash, a men's shirt, a pair of trousers, and a navy blue Equitian shirt company parka with fall fur collar, possibly the one of its kind in Australia, the only one of its kind in Australia. The offender took, also took an 18-karat gold engagement ring with a white diamond and the number 4132 engraved on the inside of the band, a Gillette safety razor, dark brown vinyl bag, and a rare collection of vinyl records from the London Philharmonic Orchestra. When he was done, the attacker left through the front door and escaped into the morning light. The family believed that the assailant was 5'8 to 5'10 with a slim to medium build. He was wearing an open-faced, navy blue balaclava and yellow surgical or dishwashing gloves. He wore a blue waterproof zip-up coat under a brown tweed jacket and clothes-fitting blue jeans and blue tennis shoes. Under the balaclava, the daughter noticed gray and brown hair with flakes of dandruff and reported that his face was unshaven. She described his breath as musty and said his, his hands were soft. In addition to the balaclava, the attacker had a piece of material covering his eyes, and he had bushy eyebrows, which were also peppered with gray. Mr. Krull came to the home equipped with everything he needed to control the family and have his way with the girl. In addition to the cord, tape, and four sets of handcuffs used to disable his victims, he brought a small black handgun, a 20-centimeter long kitchen knife with a black handle, and a small gray fabric bag. The victim told police that Mr. Krull occasionally took breaks from the assaults, making phone calls and threatening an attack on another family. We're unsure if these alleged calls were in addition to the earlier call he made to Bozo or if the sources are confused as to when the calls took place. At that time, there were another series of rapes in the area. In 1985, the Hampton rapist abducted and sexually assaulted a 14-year-old girl and a boy of the same age five months apart. Between December 4th and December 7th of 85, three women in their 30s were raped in their homes in Warrandyte, Donavale, and Boleyn. In March and August of 1987, two women were raped in their homes in Greensboro, and several unknown victims were attacked under similar circumstances in Hawthorne, Brighton, and Caulfield between 85 and 87. Victoria Police investigated the Lower Plenty incident as possibly connected to the Hampton rapist. Unfortunately, they were unable to generate any leads or retrieve any helpful evidence from the scene of the latest assault. Just over a year later, a second attack occurred that suggested another, different offender was targeting Melbourne's daughters. Ten-year-old Sharon Wills lived with her parents, Julie and John Wills, at 11 Hillcrest Avenue in Ringwood, another eastern suburb of Melbourne. Sharon was the oldest of four girls. Her twin sisters, Robin and Linda, were eight, and Annette was five. Sharon was a student at Antonio Park Primary School. She was a talented musician and sang with the Victorian Children's Choir. In fact, Sharon appeared with the choir on Channel 10's The Early Bird Show in December 1988, where they sang Happy Christmas, War is Over by John Lennon. Monday, December 26, 1988 was Boxing Day, and the Ringwood family went out to celebrate and returned at 10 p.m. Julie and John put the girls to bed in the room they shared. The girls' room had two bunk beds, and Sharon slept in one of the top bunks. The rest of the family went to sleep, but John stayed up until about 4.30 a.m. At approximately 5.30 a.m., Mr. Krull entered the Will's home by pushing the inside key of the back door out of the lock and onto a newspaper he slid underneath the door. The intruder burst into John and Julie's bedroom and turned the light on. Julie screamed at the children to get out of the house, pointing a gun at John's head. The gunman said, you're not going to do anything stupid, are you? Reports also state that he said, you're not going to be a hero, are you? Mr. and Mrs. Wills reported that the man was well-spoken and had no accent to speak of. The family told Victoria Police that the intruder wore dark, dark blue overalls, gloves, and a black balaclava with white and possibly red stitching around the eyes and mouth. Other reports claim it was a dark balaclava, and still others say that he was wearing a blue ski mask. 
The Wills estimated the intruder to be between five foot eight to five foot ten with a thin to medium build. They guessed that he was between his mid twenties and thirties. According to the website Who is Mr. Cruel, contemporary reporting claims that the family aged Mr. Cruel at a much younger age, possibly late teens or early twenties, based on his voice and language. The intruder brought several items with him to the crime scene. He carried a dark handgun with a square grip and barrel with a silver bit. He also had a flashlight, a bag, and a knife. He made Sharon's parents lie on their stomachs, then bound their hands and feet with copper electrical wire. The masked man told Julie and John that he was looking for cash. He took $35 from the nightstand and demanded to know where the phones were. Mr. Cruel went through the home cutting the phone lines with pliers he found in the house. Next, he entered the children's room. Sharon heard her mother scream and then heard the man's voice. She stayed in her bed, frozen in terror. Mr. Cruel opened the door and pointed the flashlight into the bedroom. Calling her by name, Mr. Cruel shone the torch in Sharon's eyes and told her to wake up. Sharon pretended she was still asleep and the intruder left the room for a few minutes. When he returned, he told her to wake up and get up. He rifled through Sharon's belongings and took several items, a pair of girls' panties, a knee-length cotton nightgown, a pair of thong sandals, a red pleated tartan skirt, and a white singlet or leotard. According to the podcast Melbourne Marvels, Sharon's sister slept through the high, the, pardon me, Sharon's sister slept through the entire thing. Mr. Cruel led Sharon out of the bedroom and stopped in the hallway where he took John's brown and black check jacket. He told Sharon to put the jacket on over her nightgown. The kidnapper also took a men's white shirt from a laundry basket that he used to bundle the other clothing. Mr. Cruel carried Sharon outside and onto the back porch. Sharon screamed and the kidnapper placed a red ball in her mouth. When Sharon promised she would not scream again, he removed the ball. He told her he was not going to hurt her and would reunite, reunite her with her parents in the morning when they paid ransom. Meanwhile, John Wills was able to free his wife from her bindings about 15 minutes after the intruder left their bedroom. He and Julie ran into the girl's bedroom and found that Sharon was gone. The kidnapper blindfolded Sharon, picked her up, and put her on the floor of the passenger seat in a car. According to Sharon, the sh car sounded like an older vehicle, but it smelled clean. From under her blindfold, Sharon could see that the car had bucket seats, a low glove box, and a floor gear shift with cream-colored interior. At this point, the sun was coming up, and the kidnapper may have noticed that Sharon could see. He wrapped tape around Sharon's blindfold and secured it very tightly. Sharon remembers a long drive to a house, possibly in the suburbs. Eventually, they stopped and parked in a driveway. The kidnapper took her into the house, placed her on a bed, and changed the blindfold, blindfold to iPads taped to her head. Sharon told police that a radio was on in the bedroom playing the 3TT station. The man carried Sharon to the bathroom and made her brush her teeth and bathe. When she was clean to his satisfaction, he took her back to the bedroom and sexually assaulted her. Sharon was unable to see, but she perceived the attacker had a hairy chest and facial hair, perhaps a mustache or whiskers. After he fir the first rape, Mr. Cruel gave Sharon a glass of milk and a Vegemite sandwich. He secured Sharon to the bed with a leash around her neck and told her he was going out. When she was sure he was gone, Sharon bravely peeked out from under the tape. Sharon told police that she was in a bedroom on a bed with a peach-colored headboard. On the floor at the foot of the bed was a tripod and video camera. The unit was covered with a brown, black, and gray blanket. The room had peach-colored curtains on the window and a yellow lamp on the bedside table. When he returned, Sharon's captor removed the leash and made her take another bath, after which he took her to a different room and raped her again. He forced her to take yet another bath after the assault, then placed the leash back on her. Although he left her leash to the bed, Sharon reported that when the man wasn't assaulting her, he was calm and courteous. He checked on her, fed her, and took her to the bathroom in regular inter intervals. Sharon remained gagged, blindfolded, and tied to the bed during her captivity. In, ad in addition to the leash, her hands and legs may have been handcuffed. Sharon also reported that before her release, the kidnapper bathed her again and brushed and flossed her teeth. He also cut her fingernails and toenails. Some sources state that the perpetrator made Sharon do these things herself. Mr. Cruel dressed Sharon in the white shirt he took from her home. 
Over the shirt, he covered Sharon with two green garbage bags. He placed the first over her feet and taped it around her shoulders. He placed the second bag over her head, cut a hole for her to breathe, and taped it around her body. He kept all of the clothing he took from Sharon's house, except for the man's shirt in which he dressed her. Still blindfolded, Mr. Cruel carried Sharon to a car and placed her inside. The car didn't start right away, and Mr. Cruel told her, quote, stolen cars do not always start properly. The kidnapper backed out of a driveway and drove for a very long time. Sharon claimed that sometimes he drove fast and sometimes he drove slowly, indicating that the man may have traveled both on freeways and in the suburbs. At some time around or before midnight, the kidnapper stopped the car and took Sharon out. Carrying the girl, he ran, taking breaks to catch his breath. The man eventually dropped her off at Bayswater High School, where he removed her blindfold and the garbage bags. He gave Sharon directions to a Food Plus store close by and told her to go and call her parents. He let her go, but warned her not to look at him as he walked away. Between midnight and 1.30 a.m., 18 hours after her abduction, a woman spotted Sharon walking on the corner of Orchard and Armstrong Roads in Bayswater. Sharon was calm and said, I am Sharon Wills, and I was taken from home early this morning. A man left me here and told me to go bring home. The woman took Sharon back to her house and called police. Victoria police never found the man who kidnapped Sharon Wills, but their investigation did reveal a few critical details. First, investigators believe the attacker loitered around the Wills' home for several days before the abduction. He knew her name and targeted her specifically when he entered the bedroom. There's also a possibility that the man who abducted Sharon first saw her on the local news article well before the attack. Six months prior, on July 7th, 1988, the Wills family was the subject of a local story. Julie Wills saved Sharon from a bed that caught fire because of a faulty electrical blanket. Police believe it's possible that the attacker targeted Sharon after reading the article and seeing her picture. Some have speculated that the offender may have even seen Sharon on the early bird show, although she only appears on camera for a split second. When police interviewed Sharon, she told them everything we covered above and also said that she heard two airplanes fly low overhead during their captivity. She explained that she heard the airplanes around the same time that the 7 o'clock morning news came on the radio. One witness reported that at about 11.15 p.m., a white Commodore vacationer sedan with three blue stripes on the side nearly crashed into another vehicle, turning from the Jer Jersey Road on the Mountain Highway in Bayswater. The van's headlights were off, and the driver turned his head away so the witness never saw his face. The car creeped forward about one and a half kilometers until it turned right onto Church Street. Other witnesses reported seeing a prowler in the neighborhood before the abduction. In 2022, a witness came forward claiming that about six weeks before, her brothers were playing in a vacant lot with electrical towers behind the Will's home and saw a man videotaping the home with a JVC camera. The man left abruptly when he saw the boys. They saw him pack his camera into the trunk of a gold Ford before he left. The boys described the man as 30 to 35 years old with thinning brown hair and a pot belly. Victoria police were never able to find the man who abducted Sharon Wills. Police still believe there is a possible connection between Sharon's attack and the rapes of women by the men, man known as the Hampton Rapist. Eventually, the investigation slowed to a crawl with no fruitful leads. 18 months later, another girl would endure a similar fate. 13-year-old Nicola Linus was a student at Presbyterian Ladies College. Nicola and her sister Fiona were staying at a rental home at 10 Monomeath Avenue with their parents, Brian and Rosemary Linus. Brian and Rosemary rented the home during the fall, and the family was packed and ready to return to the UK for the winter holidays. On Tuesday, July 3rd, 1990, the evening before the Linus family was to leave Melbourne, Brian and Rosemary attended one of the many fell world parties thrown by friends and neighbors. Nicola and Fiona stayed home alone while their parents attended the party. Brian and Rosemary left about 7.50 p.m. The sisters ordered pizza, which arrived about 10.05 p.m. The girls went to bed about an hour later at 11. Approximately 20 minutes later, Mr. Cruel forced open one of the windows in Brian and Rosemary's bedroom, then made his way through the home to Nicola and Fiona's room. The intruder woke Nicola by tapping her head with a long serrated knife. 
according to who is Mr. Cruel, the man said, see this here? This is a really sharp knife. Nicholas saw that the man had a gun in his right hand with a silver colored barrel and a wooden grip. He threatened Nicola with the gun, telling her it shot real bullets and would blow their heads off. Fiona must have woken up at some point because she was able to assist Nicola in describing the intruder to police. Nicola described the man as well-built with a beer belly. Nicola thought he was about 5'10", but Fiona said he was closer to 5'8". Fiona told police that she thought the man was in his 30s. Both girls said the man had a gruff, uneducated voice with an Australian accent, and he swore a lot. The intruder demanded that the girls show him where their parents kept their cash. He said, get the cash, yous then led them to their parents' bedroom and rifled through Brian's wallet. He found $4,000 in traveler's checks, but he left them behind. He then told Nicola and Fiona, lay down on the bed, use. The girls laid face down on their parents' bed. Mr. Cruel hogtied Fiona with galvanized wire and then took Nicola to the kitchen. He rifled through Rosemary's purse and stole her driver's license, Medicare card, and credit card. The intruder then cut the phone line and took the family's car keys from a hook in the kitchen. Intruder took Nicola back to her bedroom and ordered her to dress in her PLC school blazer. He also took a beach bag that he filled with several additional items of Nicola's clothing, a dress, a PLC uniform and school sweater, a pair of school track pants, several pairs of girls' panties, four pairs of socks, a t-shirt, a Melbourne football club beanie, a pleated white tennis skirt, and a pair of knee-high stockings. Mr. Cruel questioned both Fiona and Nicola about their father's employment. He told Fiona he was kidnapping her sister and would call Brian Linus in the morning with a ransom demand of $25,000. The kidnapper left the house with Nicola between 1130 and midnight and put her in the family's rental car, which was parked in the driveway. He ordered Nicola onto the floorboard, under the dash, and pulled the beanie hat over her eyes. Mr. Cruel pulled out of the driveway and drove west on Mont Albert Road. There, he stopped and taped Nicola's eyes shut and placed a baklava over her head. He told her that it would be very dangerous for her if she tried to look out of the blindfold. Next, he drove to Chaucer Avenue, dumped the car, and walked the girl down the street to another car. The car was a four-door with bucket seats, carpeting, and a gear shift on the floor. As her abductor started the engine, Nicola thought the car sounded older. The radio was on and playing station KZFM. Mr. Cruel drove Nicola for anywhere between 15 and 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Some sources report that Nicola thought they drove on one continuous stretch of road that may have been a freeway. Sometime after midnight, Mr. Cruel pulled into a driveway on the right side of a house. He led Nicola from the car across a concrete driveway and up three to seven steps, depending on the source. They entered the house and passed through a kitchen and into a bedroom with a radio playing. The man took the tape from Nicola's eyes and told her not to look if she wanted to live. He replaced the tape with iPads, as he did with Sharon Wills. When she was newly blindfolded, the man took her into the bathroom and made her brush her teeth and take a bath. When she was finished, Mr. Cruel took Nicola to a bedroom and leashed her to the bed by either her neck or ankle, depending on the source. He turned off the radio, got into bed next to her, and fell asleep. The next morning, Nicola heard nine airplanes pass over from right to left. At 10 o'clock a.m., Mr. Cruel woke and turned on the radio again. He took her from the kitchen to the bathroom and back to the bedroom throughout the day. He dressed Nicola in her school uniform and told her he had a schoolgirl fantasy about her and had followed her home from school. He also told her that the police would ask her a lot of questions when she got home. Nicola's captor held her much longer than he did his previous victim, dressing her up and sexually assaulting her for 50 hours before releasing her. According to one source, Mr. Cruel played fantasy games with Nicola, calling her Missy and also Nikki, as she was known to friends and family. On the morning of the second day, Mr. Cruel made Nicola bathe again and then dressed her in her tennis skirt. Around 2 o'clock p.m., he tethered Nicola to the bed and gave her bread and water to eat. He tied her feet together with wire and left the house for about three hours. He returned around five o'clock and explained to Nicola that he was out with a friend scouting for a place to release her. He instructed her that he would drop her off with a change of clothes and give her directions to the closest police station. Nicola was to wait 10 minutes from the time he dropped her off before she walked to the station. 
During the instructions, Mr. Krul gave Nicola the impression that the friend was at the house. He even pretended to speak to this person, although no one ever answered. Nicola told police that during her captivity, Mr. Krul took pleasure in the news stories about him. He told her he was out of town at the time of the Sharon Wills abduction. He also watched the Linus family press conference and asked Nicola, think you're worth $25,000? Sometime in the late night or early morning hours before her release, Nicola's captor told her he was packing the food in the house. He took Nicola to the bathroom where he had a sheet spread on the floor. He made Nicola stand on the sheet, undress, and shower. Nicola redressed after the man replaced her iPads with tape. He explained to Nicola that police would take her to a hospital where they would try to find evidence assuring her they would find nothing. Next, he took Nicola to a car wrapped her in a sheet, and forced her into the floor of the passenger side. The engine didn't start right away, and Mr. Krull told Nicola that his friend stole the car. He drove Nicola to the intended drop-off location. When they arrived just before 2 a.m., he removed the sheet and walked Nicola along a footpath for about 45 minutes. Excuse me, for about five minutes. They stopped and removed the tape from Nicola's eyes and gave her the clothes that he promised. He started to walk away, but changed his mind about the location. He walked Nicola further for several minutes and ultimately left her in the bushes in front of an SEC substation at 10 Tennyson Street in Kew. Before he left, he reminded her to count before calling police. 50 hours after abduction, Nicola's nightmare was finally over. She walked to a house and knocked on the door, and someone inside let her in, and she called her father. Both Wills and Linus reported hearing aircraft flying over the house where they were detained. Based on the girl's descriptions of the direction of the sound, police believed that the house where he kept his victims was somewhere under one of two flight paths to the Melbourne airport. Nicola told police that she heard the airplanes flying from her left to her right, then turn right again before fading away. She also reported that she heard no noise from traffic, trains, or pedestrians, indicating that the house was not on or near a main thoroughfare. Police looked into the flights from that day and determined that the house was likely under the second of the two flight paths, one that comes in from the east across Tula Marine and over Eltham and Coburn, turning north over East Keeler. Victoria police searched thousands of homes in the area, but never found Mr. Krull's lair. The investigation into Nicholas' kidnapping, like those of Sharon Wills and the Lower Plenty victim, grew cold. Nine months later, Mr. Krull struck again, taking a 13-year-old girl from her home. This time, there was no happy ending. Like Nicola Linus, 13-year-old Carmine Shan was a student at Presbyterian Ladies College. Carmine's parents, Phyllis and John Chan, were successful, well-respected members of their community. The Chans owned two Chinese restaurants, Ming's in F. Eltham and Ming's Takeaway in Lower Plenty. The Chan family lived in a very large, high-end home at 212 Serpels Road, in Temple's Toe with, the, with their three daughters, 13-year-old Carmine, 9-year-old Carly, and 7-year-old Karen. The house was surrounded by a two-meter fence with an electric gate and was pr protected by an alarm system. Saturday, April 13, 1991, was the first day of Australia's autumn season. The weather was mild, with some light rain reaching a high of 22 degrees Celsius, or 71 degrees Fahrenheit. School was out for the holidays, and the Chan daughters, daughters spent the day engaged in various activities. Carmen spent the morning taking tennis lessons and Camberwell Tennis at, tenor, at Camberwell Tennis Center on Bullying Road. She had lunch with her mother after the Bullying Plaza at the Bullying Plaza, and then went to the library alone to study. That afternoon, friends of the Chans picked up the girls and took them to the family restaurant in Eltham. It was customary for someone other than the Chans to pick the girls up from school and other places, then bring them to the restaurant for dinner. The girls ate with their mother and played outside the restaurant. At 6.30 p.m., an employee drove the girls to their home. John Chan was waiting for them at the house. He left for work at 7.30, and Carmen was charged with babysitting the two younger girls. All three sisters were reading and watching TV when a man entered the home wearing a greenish-gray tracksuit and a brown balaclava. At approximately 8.40 p.m., Carmen and Carly went into the kitchen for something to eat. 
The intruder confronted the girls in the hallway holding a silver carving knife. He grabbed Carmen and Carly by the hair and forced them into Carmen's bedroom where Karen was hiding behind a door. The man that gagged the two younger girls and tied them up. He ordered them to get into a cupboard, pushed a bed against the door and told the girls he would be back for them. The girls heard Carmen say, don't do that. They called out to Carmen as the kidnapper left with their sister. About 10 minutes later, Karen and Carly freed themselves and called the restaurant to tell their father what had happened. When the Chans returned home, they found their red Toyota vandalized in front of the house. Someone spray painted the car with the following message, payback, more to come, and more non with a reference to Asian drug dealers. Investigation of the Chan house revealed that the kidnapper entered the house through a window in the living room, although several doors in the house were unlocked. Police dogs tracked Carmen's scent from the kitchen sliding door through a garden and across a tennis court to a side fence that dropped two meters onto the street below. About 300 meters down that street was a vacant block where the kidnapper may have forced Carmen into a car. In the weeks before, neighbors reported a man sitting in a car for several days watching the private school bus stop across the street from the Chan home. Another witness reported that two weeks before the abduction, an unidentified tradesman showed up at the Chan's front door looking for work. Just days before, something or someone kept tripping the Chan's security alarm. Annoyed, the family turned off the system. At 11 o'clock p.m. on the night of the abduction, a man reported hearing a gunshot as he walked along Edgar's Creek on Elizabeth Street in North Coburg. He saw another man wearing overalls and a light rain jack standing, standing by a utility vehicle. The man's back was to the witness, but he did see the man holding a gun in the air. Two or three days after the abduction, the resident of a house overlooking a landfill along Edgar's Creek observed a man in a hooded raincoat digging next to a truck in the rain. Han family waited nearly one agonizing year with no success in finding their oldest daughter. On Thursday, April 9, 1992, a dog walker found a human skull in the landfill near Edgar's Creek behind an electrical substation at the intersection of Mahoney's Road and High Street. Through dental records, police confirmed that the skull belonged to Carmen Chan. According to Who is Mr. Cruel, there were, several, there were three bullet wounds in the back of the skull. Australian crime stories, however, reported that the killer shot Carmen in the side of the head. Either way, the nature of the injuries indicated an execution-style murder. Police found the rest of Carmen's body decayed remains at the site. The stage of decomposition told investigators that the young girl had been dead for about a year. Some members of law enforcement questioned whether that Carmen Chan was abduction and murder was the work of Mr. Cruel. The bullet wounds had the flavor of, of a professional hit and the gra graffiti on the car hinted at revenge and drug activity. Police investigated John Chan's background, however, and found nothing indicating involvement in drugs or any other criminal enterprise. Others can't ignore the similarities between the Chan abduction and the three prior attacks. The assailant meticulously planned each home invasion after stalking his victims and learning their habits and homes. He also forced family members into closets in more than one case. The abductions all took place during or near school holidays. Moreover, the perpetrator in each case used some form of a pretense to throw investigators off track. In 1991, Victoria Police assembled a special task force dedicated to the Mr. Cruel investigation. Led by Commander David Sprague, Task Force Spectrum sought advice from law enforcement agencies around the world, including the FBI. Spectrum reached out to the Melbourne community for any information about the attacks. Tens of thousands of tips came in from everyone who had a suspicioned neighbor or a friend they thought fit the bill. Officers on the task force physically investigated more than 30,000 houses in their quest to find Mr. Cruel's lair. They sent letters to Victoria's physicians asking for information on their patients. The task force interviewed more than 27,000 individuals during the three-year investigation including doctors, teachers, journalists, priests, and police officers. Ultimately, Spectrum was left with 32 men who could not be eliminated. One was a convicted sex offender who recently did time, seven were red flagged by the FBI as fitting the profile, and one suspect was admitted to a psychiatric facility in the year after Carmen's murder. Spectrum was never able to find enough evidence to arrest any of their suspects. 
By 1994, the investigation had made little progress. The task force disbanded and the cases grew colder. A new special unit, Task Force Apollo, reopened the Mr. Cruel case in 2010, hoping that new forensic technology would bring them closer to identifying the child rapist. Apollo spent six months reviewing each and every report and all the evidence from the initial investigation. The effort brought Victoria, the effort brought Victoria Police no closer to an arrest. In 2022, Channel 9, Australia's program under investigation, announced that they used cutting-edge geographic profiling technology in the hopes of determining how Mr. Krull selected his victims and dump sites. Veteran investigator and expert in new technology, Mike King, claims he has a new theory about the case, that Mr. Krull may have worked in the electrical profession or may have posed as someone who did. Using mapping software called GIS, the under-investigation team generated a map that showed similarities between the four cases. Mr. Krull released both Sharon Wills and Nicola Lyons near electrical substations. Moreover, the first three victims lived near substations as well. As we mentioned earlier, the back of the Wills residence butted right up against a block of electrical towers. King believes that the new information constituted a major breakthrough in the case. He, he told Channel 9 that, quote, the offender has to feel comfortable in order to function. From a geographic pro perspective, we just have to keep thinking, why is he comfortable in this area? Why is he selecting the victims where he is? And why is he disposing of them where he is? Victoria police have not publicized whether they're focusing on a particular suspect. However, Channel 9 broadcast a new sketch that they believe matches the description of Mr. Cruel. Despite no arrests in the four cases, police are not without a list of suspects. Mm -hmm. Of the thousands of people investigated since 1988, there remain seven individuals on the official suspect list. We're saving the bulk of the discussion of suspects for the panel, but for now, we want to give you a brief overview of the man many consider to be the prime suspect in the case. One of the major suspects is retired French professor, Dr. Brian Allen Elkner. Elkner secured a position as a professor of French literature at the University of Melbourne in 1972. From April of 72 to May of 74, the professor sexually assaulted five teenage girls and one woman in their homes. Elkner bound his victims, threatened them with a knife during the assaults. In three of the attacks, Elkner cut the victims' clothes with scissors. Elkner was convicted in 1974 of rape, indecent assault, assault with attempt to rape, and simple assault. At trial, a forensic psychologist testified that Elkner had fantasies about tying girls up and raping them. The judge sentenced Elkner to 10 years for his crimes. However, he was released in 1979. Elkner moved back to Hampton after his release, where he established himself as a freelance writer. Investigators searched Engler's home after the Chan murder and found a balaclava and a knife hidden in the roof of his home. During the task force spectrum operation, detectives questioned the convicted rapist for 12 hours. Former task force commander Sprague was sure that Elkner was Mr. Cruel. Despite Sprague's conviction that they had their man, Victoria police were never able to make the arrest. Some who have worked the Mr. Cruel case do not think Elkner is the prime suspect, and there are at least a half a dozen other viable suspects who cannot be eliminated. We're going to get into the known suspects in greater detail soon, but right now, we want to get Lee up here for his profile of Australia's most notorious child sex offender. Thank you, Alex. And this is the whole point of a profile. You have all these suspects you got to get through. Which ones do you prioritize? You can't look at them all. You can't give 100% to all of them. Uh, you've got limited resources and time. So what are we going to do here? We're going to look at, uh, based on my education and experience, who I think Mr. Cruel is. White, obviously, between 30 and 45. Some of the descriptions place him as a teenager or in his 20s, but there's also descriptions of an older offender. And this person has a lot of criminal experience. And I think you could only, I don't think a young man would have that. So off that too, he's also interested in these extreme forensic countermeasures, clipping the nails, cutting the phone cords, even misleading them by pretending that there's an accomplice there. I think driving around probably in circles unnecessarily so that they lose track of where they're going, walking them, that similar thing. So once again, that's, that's a lot of criminal experience. So that's one of 
probably three things that I can think of. You're looking at uh, law enforcement or former law enforcement. You're looking at someone who is a police groupie. So that's someone with an intense interest in detective work and crime and law enforcement, though they haven't really um, professionally done either of the two. Or you have someone who is a, a professional criminal, like somebody who has made something of a living from burglary or, or like it in the past. Priors, I think, you're, burglary, that's obvious. Voyeurism, offenders that, uh, that look inside and stalk people, guess what? They peek through windows too. So you might see window peeping in his past. Obviously, sex offenses against children too. Is he a pedophile? He's on that line between pedophilia and hebophilia, which is sexual att sexual attraction to people who are going through puberty. So it's 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 hard to say exactly, but we don't really need to specify it. I think he's preferentially attracted to this age range. If he wasn't, he would abduct grown women. No, he chooses uh, twelve to uh, what fourteen year olds in that range. High psychopathy, but I don't think that he would meet the actual diagnostic cutoff uh, for a psychopath. That's 30 plus on the PCLR. I think there's certainly narcissism there, maybe a bit of obsessive compulsive personality disorder, perhaps. And um, but he does have the, the, the core elements of a psychopath, which is he's not rattled. He's not alerted. He's very cool. In fact, Mr. Cruel was initially Mr. Cool, because he was cool under pressure. They changed that for obvious reasons. But yeah, you know, to stay in the house um, once you've taken control, to uh, commit a rape, eat, and then, and then do it again, to keep someone this long, this is someone who's not easily rattled and obviously dull empathy. So that's why I think there's psychopathy there. I think that uh, him, uh, the sexual elements of the crime, they're obviously really strong and important, but I think arguably the thrill of doing it, of planning how to get into the house, how to control the family and, uh, and following it on the news and going, that's me, Mr. Cruel. Everyone's talking about me and I'm getting away with it. I think this is arguably more important for, for him. I think he actually enjoys the aspects of misleading and this might be the most salient element of the crime. So he sees himself as something of a consummate criminal professional. What does that mean? It means if you find him, he's going to have detective magazines, I would say probably equipment from spy stores, that kind of thing. He was described as being uneducated in um, uneducated in speech, but I think perhaps this again is him misleading. It's it's hard to sound more educated than you are authentically, but it's not hard to sound less educated if you're intentionally misleading. So this could be one of those forensic countermeasures. I think that he is also middle class. He's roughly targeting people that he's um, in the same social class as because he's familiar with um, that those neighborhoods, those homes, those type of people. And uh, so if he's uneducated too, which I said, as I said, he may not be. But he's certainly intelligent. Now, sometimes when I say high intelligence or above average intelligence, people think, oh, wait, you tell me he's a genius. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that he's in the high average to above average range. Uh, also, finally, I'll say this. He's highly conscientious, too. Conscientiousness is a personality trait, five-factor model of personality. Uh, it's one of the most consistent that we see across populations. And it's uh, things like uh, work ethic orderliness, cleanliness. And we can see with the amount of care he takes to invent, to approach the crimes, to breach the homes, when once he's abducted the victim, all the forensic countermeasures, the bathing them, uh, and all, all these things would lead me to believe that this is somebody who is high conscientiousness. What does that mean? It means he's going to have a clean house. It means his car is going to be clean. And he's probably also going to be neat in physical appearance. And finally, possible germaphobe. With that, I'll bring up Alex and Morph, and let's talk about uh, my little profile. I, I think you hit on a lot of things I sort of, you know, came to my mind as, as far as his, uh, you know, possible clues to who he is. Um, you, one thing that blows me away is despite the horrible things these young girls went through, the details that they were able to remember to later on recount to police and so specifically um i i you know just it, it and maybe because they're younger maybe it you know, i don't know if the, a younger mind is able to somehow 
compartmentalize what's going on, but still have a, you know, because I, I couldn't even imagine being in that situation, but yet these girls came away with, with that. But one thing that really jumped out to me on this case is, you know, I've covered the East Area Rapist extensively. Mm. And this case mirrors that case so much that the FBI actually considered that it could be him having gone over to Australia. Very regimented, very has a very specific way of doing things, stalking victims, um, dealing with them when he gets in the house, this uncanny thing of showing up at the right moment, catching everyone off guard, showing up when parents aren't home in some cases, you know, he's eating their food. It was, it's straight, it's scary how similar yeah. this person was, mm. as opposed to some bumbling rapist that sees a, a girl in the house, kicks the door down, doesn't have any plan. He's just going mm. to attack this girl real quick and then get out as fast as he can. This is a different kind of person. I think this is a, a, a very dangerous predator. Um, and because they're so careful, because of the things you mentioned, the countermeasures, you know, I, I, I'd be surprised if there weren't more victims out there someplace in, oh, yeah. in another area um, yeah. that that he might have gone on to do more stuff. Well, yeah, exactly. More obviously, I thought of East Area Rapist, Golden State Killer. That's the one that's closest to. But it is a type. And uh, you, you see a lot of this uh, um, reoccur with these types of offenders like you have. Uh, Colonel Russell Williams in Canada. I don't know if you're familiar with that case, but he was an Air Force colonel who uh, broke into houses and he was mostly a panty thief that graduated to sexual assault and eventually sexual homicide. But he would do things that you didn't need to do too, like um, picking the locks. Anyone who's uh, accomplished in breaking and entering will tell you that just takes too much time. You smash the window and, and you enter that way. Uh, but it was like, this is, this is a part of the fantasy that he really enjoys, like going, doing mm -hmm. reconnaissance. Right. And um, I, so it, it's a, a Raider, Dennis Raider, BTK. That's yeah. another one, you know, um, mm -hmm. hits. I have my hits. I I've got my kit and projects and it's, it's something about the way these people see the world. So you can say, well, what's the similarities across them? And that's what I did in formulating this profile you know, I, I looked at the commonalities among those type of offenders and uh, because it's a psychological type that manifests in behavior and goals and, and presentation. I, uh, I love it when I get to like do my, you know, as with you as my mentor, when I do my own profile of someone when I can, and then I can just go through and you say, and I ch check off everything. Um, you mentioned him having an OCD type personality and I, Absolutely. That was one thing that really stuck out to me is that he's not just cleaning them before he releases them. Right. He is doing it in between possibly each assault. I think this guy has is absolutely I agree with you. He's a germaphobe, probably has had sexual relations with women and was repulsed by it because he mm. can't control things like body fluids and smells and even their movements. Mm. And I think it's with him. It's way more than just a forensic countermeasure. He laying down the sheet in the bedroom and there was something about the, the house when he says to one of tells one of the victims that he's going to start packing the food. If this was his house, why would he need to do that? So it made me wonder if perhaps the first thing I thought when I the description of the bedroom was that it was a furnished home, not his own furniture, because those are not colors that a man would generally choose. Um, even though in the 80s, those colors were really popular, but also wondering perhaps he lived with a woman in a location where he had to make sure she couldn't find anything or even a vacant house. Hmm. Yeah, I think that or it's possible. A relatives. Yeah. I, I think a relative's was... house, maybe, that he had access to. I think it's possible that this guy would be married um, or divorced, right? It's not someone mm -hmm. that. I mean, he could stay in a marriage. Raider did. Williams did. But I think he'd be kind of unpleasant. One of the things I forgot to mention is, like, this guy's going to be employed. He's going to have a job. But he's going to be disagreeable. Like, the people that are around right. him are going to see him as being kind of aloof or um, full mm -hmm. of himself or something. And I think his I think his uh, wife or partner would have the same takeaway. And I th this is why he's attracted somewhat to uh, younger women, because... Uh, he sees them as easier to control and more uh, pure as well. 
like yeah. you were saying, Alex, yeah. I think he sees he probably finds like adult women as just being um, annoying and and um, more difficult to uh, and dirty you know, and dirty. That's a big part. Used up to this, yeah. you know, this might have Used that virgin up. thing. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. Along those lines, um, would, would this person in their relationships with these other women, lady, do you think would he before being intimate with them, would he insist that they shower that kind of thing? Would that be a trait that his uh, yeah good right. call morph. yeah good, good call morph that is something that you would see in his background. So, uh, if you're interviewing uh, potential suspects, um, you want to go to their former um, romantic partners and ask about mm -hmm. their habits. Does he make you wear a schoolgirl girl uniform? Mm -hmm. He make you bathe, yeah. right? You know. Yeah. So now there was something that you said, Lee, that. With all of his about him having a neat physical appearance, and you would think that that would be the case, considering his bent toward extreme cleanliness. However, one of the victims described him as having that brown gray hair with dandruff in it. And yeah. that tells me that he's not. I mean, what most people consider dandruff is actually just dry flakes of skin, which tells me that he's not really taking care of himself. Uh, maybe it's different leading up to the crimes or during the commission of crimes. Maybe there's a bit of a breakdown, mm -hmm. reestablishes sure. it, or he just has bad dandruff and it's hard to keep yeah. under control. Yeah, yeah. What I mean, because I... these these do take place almost a year in between. They aren't, you know, yeah. rapid fire attacks. Now, yeah. there was one interesting thing too that you know I mentioned how the the victims all had really good details. They all said five foot eight to five foot 10. There were certain things that were common, but then there were certain things that weren't like one of the victims described very specifically gray hair, gray eyebrows mm -hmm. that might indicate an older perpetrator. But right. then one felt he was in twenties. One I thought was an interesting thing said he had soft hands. So maybe yeah. that's not a blue collar worker. Maybe that's, I don't a, think a it's a blue. Yeah. I don't yeah. think it's a blue collar worker at all. Um, right. Which would clash with the electrician yeah. uh, theory, then probably. I well, I know Doug has a lot to say about the electrician theory, so I've never seen we'll um, an electrician's hands. I just realized, um, would an electrician yeah, have hardened hands? I know they work yeah. with their hands and they handle yeah. tools. They handle wires. They do a lot of twisting and and stuff. Indoor, but outdoor, I, yeah. I get, uh, you know, I would get the gist of soft hands. You know that it's maybe i would tend to think at least maybe it's more academic more um mm -hmm. uh, some some along those lines but yeah mm -hmm. cloyd and I, I i was once asking cloyd about police officers hands because i couldn't figure out where they would fall in there too and i can't remember his answer so we'll have to ask him about that but it might be a good um good time to get cloyd up do you want should we get cloyd up let's ask him about that I, let's I, let's take this one comment because we're talking about the dandruff. So before we move on the Cloyd, mm -hmm. but Patricia Burns, people who wash their hair can dry the scalp, which causes dandruff. So maybe he's such a yeah. neat freak and such a clean freak. He's overwashing his hair uh, and he's causing his own dandruff, basically. It's actually dry scalp. It's not dandruff. Dandruff is a is a either viral or bacterial condition that comes from the scalp. So I think that that would make a difference with a with an actual case of dandruff. You're going to have a smelly scalp, an oily scalp, mm. and you know. Whereas with just dry scalp, you're going to see the flakes, but you aren't going to have that that odor that goes along with it. And what? So what's oh, the Susan. head and shoulders? What's the head and shoulders shampoo <laughs> for? That's for dandruff, right? Uh, well, it says it is. And if you really want to make everything worse, use head and shoulders. Uh, I was a hairdresser for like 30 years before I went to law school and everything. So, um, yeah, it's they, they teach you there. There's a difference and never use head and shoulders on on a dry scalp, on a, on a flaky scalp condition. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> Yeah, I could really get into this conversation, but we can't. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be curious to ask morph, morph what it's like to, to be bare up top and, and have to do uh, I get away with just the soap. I can just do yeah. soap. Oh, no, there. it's still skin. I got beards. So are we going to bring dude. Cloyd up? <laughs> hey, Cloyd. Hey, guys. Hey, so, Cloyd. cop hands, where where do they fall on the soft spectrum? Well, not as soft as mine. No, it depends on, you know, what, because there's a lot of jobs in, in cop jobs, you know, patrol jobs, detective jobs, vice jobs, narcotics jobs. So it, it kind of depends. 
But I was thinking, you know, this guy, not necessarily an electrician, but he works for the power company that has all the substations and the wires, and he's a lineman or something, or even a supervisor. Excuse the noise. And, uh, and, and he would have an opportunity to observe these people all the time. Plus, he'd be, that's why they're all near where the power stations and the power lines are because he's there and nobody notices him because he's there working when he's there. And so he'd slip right in. Also, the other thing I was thinking while you guys were talking about the guy trying to cover up. So usually for me, that's a guy that's been arrested before and had u- evidence like that used against him, mm. you know, and like the uh, DNA or whatever, fingernail clippings and this and that. And so he's making sure this time I'm not going to do it. But the, uh, the uh, rapist professor five, five, founding a baklava in his house is pretty intriguing also. So, I mean, that's, that's just where I am in this whole thing. I, but I think I agree that electricians would have, rougher hands because they're you know they work with their hands you know they're doing all this mm-hmm. stuff and twisting and an actual electrician which is different than somebody that works in the power system hey, rebecca casella says every electrician i know has rough hands well there you go yeah. question answered there you go yep um all right so so then that's going away from and which which is what i thought right um not blue collar i don't think he's blue collar um okay. yeah i don't yeah um might be a little handy, but he's that's not what he does on a regular basis. Um, right. Criminal criminal background was in the profile, um, either that or um, a cop, which D'Angelo yes. was, and Williams was in the Air Force, and Raider was in the Air Force, and then a compliance officer. So that's yeah. where I got into that yeah. territory. Um, I don't like to throw out the it was a cop. Some people do that, like yeah, they do, how, it, all got them, do it all the time. But in this case, I thought that yeah, potentially. You know what about this house? Maybe maybe he had no connection to the house, but he knew it was vacant because he's a burglar and he'd set it up knowing they're out of town. He's going to take it to their house. That mm. gets him out of the way. You know, that's the, mm-hmm. it's not his house and not anybody in his family's house, but he knows these people are away and he's using right. their hands. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's get dug up. Okay. Susanna is also with us. She did oh, make it. Okay. So. We should yeah. get her on and talk about evidence. There's a lot of, Potential DNA stuff here. It okay. depends. I, I was surprised how little I found on any efforts of DNA testing. Yeah, but this, you know, back when this happened, it was long, It was before DNA was mainstream. So. I mean, since. Yeah, I know. But since. That's because they put this stuff on the shelf and they forget about it. And nobody thinks about that stuff. That's the problem. They just have to yeah. take it down and do it. Okay, so should Susanna? we get Su- Susanna up? Yeah. Let's yeah. Susanna. She's a busy lady. <laughs> Hi, guys. Yes, I heard DNA. My ears perked up. Here I am. Yeah. So, yeah. The I at first, you know, I when I was listening to this and hearing all the bathing and the brushing of the teeth and everything, I thought, wow, this guy's really like forensically advanced and countermeasures. But I'm not so sure because the first case was in 1987. And I looked it up, and the first DNA case in Australia in uh, uh, in Australia was 1989. So mm-hmm. I don't know if that's necessarily what's happening. Even in the United States, first case was 1987, and then hearing that he's making these individual shower prior to anything occurring, it seems like it's more of like you said, Lee, kind of a compulsion or obsession or, you know, something that is something other than just forensic countermeasures. Now, on the other hand, in at least one of the cases, um, I believe I heard you say that he's wearing gloves or had something on his hands. So that, yeah, preventing fingerprints from being left behind, but is not necessarily thinking about DNA, I would say. There's fibers about, too, right? Up. Fiber evidence was um, mm-hmm. was big as well. So it could be thinking there's yes. bits of carpet or, you know. Sure. Yes. And I would agree, agree with that. Um, and so, yeah, so it doesn't mean he's not thinking about uh, forensic evidence in any way. But, and, you know, yes, there was serology testing, um, blood typing, things like that at that time that he, he could be aware of. But I think it seems to me there's something else going on as well with the, yeah. the cleaning or the bathing beforehand as well. Um, so I do think that there could be some DNA evidence. I mean, if 
I don't know if it's clear if he was wearing gloves in every incident or every home that he broke into. There's lots of, lots of things. It seems like he touched, tied up people, mm -hmm. uh, cut phone lines, you know, so anything like that, if that's still an evidence, things that he would have come into direct right. contact with, then that's something we can think about. But of course there's the, the victims themselves. So their sexual assault kits should, you know, still be preserved, I would assume. And I would testing assume could that. be done. Well, uh, hopefully. Um, <laughs> what little I did, I did say... find said that they lost oh. some of it, lost <sighs> a rope that was put in a plastic bag and that it, it was gone. So I'm not sure. I okay. was really shocked at how little they taught any of our sources talked about efforts to okay. test DNA. And so I don't, I don't know if there is anything. Right. I think there and, would and, be. Yeah. And I hear, you know, yes. Yeah, so these cases are older, late eighties, early nineties. I did hear that you said that they reopened the cases and were doing some additional testing in 2010, even in 2010 though, like I, I don't know where Australia was or, or Victoria, you know, the crime lab there was in terms of capabilities. Um, they may or may not have had the ability to do YSTR testing. Um, so even if, you know, some of this DNA that was on these victims that was washed away through this bathing, um, there could still be DNA inside, the, you know, in the vaginal cavities. Um, there could still be DNA on the skin. We know now even after bathing, even after washing, it's still possible to get male DNA. Um, sometimes I'm not going to say all the time. It's going to depend upon how well the person washes. Surprisingly, on the neck, it's pretty common. And I think it's because women's hair, if the long hair is kind of covering and not really oh. getting all of that off, we can often get DNA on the on the neck from, from a male. So I think that those are things to think about for retesting. And it also, you know, I don't know... Um, if all of Australia is the same in terms of their testing, but I know that recently Queensland has had a lot of issues with their, their laboratory. They've come under a lot of fire because they were discontinuing testing. They would say, listen, there's a low amount of DNA, so we're not doing any testing, any further testing, which I am not a proponent of because I always say, listen, quantitation, which is a step that tells you how much DNA is present, it is just an estimate. And it is not, you can have zero DNA coming up on your quant and still sometimes get a little bit of a result. Um, so I am not a proponent of discontinuing testing, meaning okay, it says it's a low level, so I'm just not going to do anything else. And that's what they were doing. Um, and so from, I know that a lot of samples in their cases were just not further tested. I don't know. I couldn't find anything to say that Victoria was necessarily doing that. But it, if that was a policy of theirs as well, they could have had something in 2010 and said, eh, it's just not enough DNA or not enough male DNA. We're just not going to go forward with it. Um, so just with this many, this many victims, this much contact and touching, and anytime you have any type of intimate contact, that's where we're going to have that transfer of DNA. So I, I would say that there's still possibilities. If the evidence exists, there's still possibilities for DNA in, in, in these cases. It seems like there's bound to be a hair someplace here that right. and you've mentioned in past episodes you can get dna from hairs now um uh, yeah. so you would think they would have collected their clothing that kind of stuff uh, there's bound to be a hair i would think someplace in this evidence that i would think and then one of the things that i'd seen was uh the garbage bags on on one of the victims uh sharon two green garbage bags and tape on the garbage bags that might be a very good source of DNA. Assuming he was not wearing gloves when he, un, you know, unrolled that tape and, and placed it on there, that would basically collect skin cells and and preserve them potentially. Yeah. I I think he took off the bags and the blindfold before he released okay. her. And so he took it. He took those with him then. I think or, so. Okay. All right. What do you think about the uh, the murder victim, the Asian girl? Do you think that he did that? Because I don't think necessarily. I can make a case for it, but I wouldn't want to definitely link that. He was. Yeah, how I don't old know again? if those are. Yeah, thirteen. She was, she was thirteen. She, okay. Yeah. Why was she sh 
killed when the other ones weren't, though. It's not like she's much older. I have a theory. What is it? My theory um, is that if they are connected, that he watched the press coverage, saw the picture, the sketch of the bedroom, realized that his first victim or second victim, Sharon, had seen something. Then with Nicola, he tells her, if you look, I'm going to kill you. So now he's aware that they might possibly be able to see. So then, and some people have suggested this in Chan, is that Chan did see something. And by this point, he was prepared to do what he didn't want to do, which wasn't part of his fantasy, which was kill. I know in the East Area Rapist case, the experts told them, this guy's going to eventually kill someone. All he needs is the right motive to do it. And he's going to start killing people. And, and sure enough, that's what happened. So I wonder if this guy was always going to, and it just took something to nudge him to do it. Yeah. What do you I, think about that? Well, I, I wanted to say like, what's the other possibility? It's that it was linked to organized crime. I don't know. Cloyd would probably know more about this than me, but this whole like, Hey man, we'll kill your kids. I think it's more of a myth than the reality. It's like if you've burned someone in organized crime, they're going to kill you. Yeah. You're not going to kill kill your kid generally. Yeah, that's generally the case. Generally, that that's kind of stuff in TV and stuff too that people hear. But uh, it doesn't say it couldn't happen. But yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. And then what would you? And then you write it all over the car. So like, if you're a cop, like, yeah. come and look in this direction because this is organized <laughs> crime, right? No. Yeah. So that's right. the one thing where I can make the argument because of his um, his uh, diversions and his forensic countermeasures. And you can tell this guy wants to communicate, right, Alex? Like. You yeah, oh, the totally. Aggressive transformer yeah. thing. Hopefully, yeah. you guys are starting to pick up on that a little bit too. You can tell this is a guy that wants to like call and talk about. He's, yeah, what he's, he's one doing. step away from that. Yeah, he's one step <laughs> away from that. And so, you know, he could probably justify it as well. I'll, I'll do uh, like a kind of uh, verbal staging, um, mm -hmm. written staging by by putting that on the car, and that way he can say, you know, I'm here. It's me. Without going, it's it's me. So uh, he mm -hmm. can show he's present. He can communicate without actually revealing anything about himself, but in doing so does reveal something about himself. Right. So it could be, I mean, that's the argument for it. Right. And of course this dude would have a gun. I mean, he would be one of those Australians with a gun because of that same personality mm -hmm. profile. Right. Yeah. So Drew's not a sadist. The, sorry. Sorry. From sorry. From somebody from Melbourne. Sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. He's also not a sadist. I mean, he's called Mr. Cruel and what no. he does is cruel, but in the, the range of the offenders we've discussed who are serial, he's really not that cruel. So the idea that if he was to kill someone that he would stab them or strangle them with a ligature versus like, well, now I have to kill you, you know, quick with a gun. Um, you know, I, I would go into the quick with a gun or else if he was into the more mm -hmm. sadistic stuff, we'd see that play out in the, the treatment of the victims during the race. Right. Yeah. He was taking them to the bathroom regularly yeah giving them food and all that mm. stuff. Mm -hmm. He's not beating them or doing, yeah. not putting cigarettes no. out on them, that kind of no. thing. He's not yeah. that no. level of, of violence. Mm. It's just, if I have to kill you because you saw something, then I will, but I won't enjoy it. And I'll use a gun and it's quick and it's sufficient. And so that's the case for, for him doing it, but I just don't think necessarily. Right. So uh, Drew tells us we have somebody from Melbourne who has some comments and I'd love to see what, what they have to say. Penguin Vic. The 3 July 1990 kidnapping took place at 11.30 p.m. on a Tuesday night during a normal school week for virtually all Victorian schools. Yeah, um, many have claimed in that all of these attacks occurred during school holidays and that is not the case. Um, and it's nice to hear exactly what days um, or which cases were actually during during school. Says one public record myth that keeps getting repeated is that all four linked Mr. Cruel crimes from 1987 to 1991 took place during school holidays. They ended up in the official police profile and it's not so. Discrepancy. Mm, that's, yeah. That's why the disclaimer for our sources. The offender demanded $25,000 ransom for Nicola Linus, the exact same figure for the Graham Thorne kidnapping of 7 July 1960. Both students went to Presbyterian schools. Hmm. Mm. 
And also remember with Chan and Linus, both of them went to uh, Presbyterian Ladies College. So they were both students there. And when we talk about suspects, there is someone who taught both of them. Hmm. Uh, but he doesn't get the ransom, does it? And he doesn't really actually follow up on that. So no. I, I'm just going to, and we're not going to get into it, but I'm just going to like touch at the JonBenet Ramsey case because one of the things is why would you ask for a ransom and then not get it? And my whole argument has been, and don't make assumptions about what I think, but my whole argument has been because it's part of a fantasy about being a kidnapper. It's not a serious kidnapping. Sure. Everyone's like, well, if there's a kidnapper, they must be like professionals. No. No. So same or, with here. Or it's misdirection, yeah. maybe. Yeah, it's thank you, Morph. Yeah. It's part of his criminal image, right? Like I said, he sees mm -hmm. himself as this consummate professional. It's like, and then I'll ransom you. He's fantasizing about, like, you know, uh, being something greater than he is. And then he actually thinks about it. He goes, I'm not going to do that. That's really risky. By the way, why would you pick 25000 It's such a low amount. Right. Yeah. Rebecca Casella says her putting up a fight might have ruined his fantasy. Yeah, possibly. Possibly. That's another I assume she's talking shooting. about Carmen. Car yes, yeah. the uh, the the murder victim. That too. That too, yeah, exactly. Might have tried to escape. There's a number of reasons why I might have killed her. Yeah. Could it be that she knew him? She recognized him? That could be a... There is motive. somebody in the suspect pool who frequented the family's restaurants. Interesting. Penguin victims. Uh, Penguin Vic says bozo was actually quite common, but worry war was very rare. Both expressions are from American cartoon literary figures too. Hmm. Yeah. I didn't come across worry wart. Bozo. I've heard bozo. I mean, I've I've yeah. lived in Canada. Sure. I've lived in the UK. Yeah. I've been to America a lot. I'm pretty sure I've heard bozo in all three places. Worry wart is sort of an old phrase, isn't it? I haven't heard that in a long time. You're such a worry wart. It's a fun one. In a long time. It's like saying I fiddle. hear it a lot because I am one. Yeah, fiddle sticks. <laughs> oh, I love that. You, you just reminded these, me of my grandma. Bring these back. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say with the Carmine uh, Chan case, if it was someone that frequented the restaurant, were the younger sisters there? as well at, oh i guess he was, was he wearing a mask though when he first came in so they wouldn't necessarily recognize him but right. carmine might have later okay yeah that makes sense mm. penguin vic says the photo of carmine chan shown first up was when she was about eight why police and the media keep using this as a mystery she was 13 and a half when kidnapped and so is her photo on her memorial stone yeah why would they ridiculous i don't know uh, is it because it's not supposed to be used for um, anything productive and it's just uh, sentimental? Perhaps. Possibly. I mean, why would people have to know what she looks like? I guess that's it. And then they've got one. and Well, well maybe they're them. hoping that somebody saw her during the well, abduction. Right. I mean, it was a year. So, yeah, right. if they, I would think they would have used a They would a not use an update one. Yeah. 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 Let's get dug up. Yeah. I'm going to talk about the he's geo profiling. Yeah. Doug McGregor, a geo profiler. He's been on the show a few times before. We're going to get him up because this is a great case for um, geographical profiling. So, Doug, welcome back, my amigo. Thanks, hey, Doug. guys. How's everybody doing? I'm doing okay. Good. You, you get good. to talk now, so I get to kick back. I'm, I'm I feel great. sorry for you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, this case is huge. So, there's a lot of material. Uh, feel free to jump in or cut me off anytime you want. Um, I think I sent Alex 17 or 18 maps, yeah. so we can awesome go through maps. some of them or all of them. Um, so this case is, this case is pretty unique and, uh, just, you know, I just want to, for the record, I never actually, I didn't work the case. Um, I unofficially gave my opinion on the case to some individuals. Uh, I guess I, I do that quite a bit. Um, when when an active case or a cold case comes up, uh, whether it's a professional such as a, a forensic psychologist, psychiatrist, um, a criminologist, or law enforcement uh, personnel, and there's an ongoing case, sometimes they reach out to me um, unofficially and they ask my opinions. Um, I don't get any 
case information when that happens because obviously that kind of stuff could be career ending but they uh they kind of just want my opinion in the background so that's kind of what i did here um and obviously this was a cold case at that time so this case is pretty neat and interesting in the fact that i did kind of a deduction and induction on this case so when i first looked at the case i looked at it from the the canonical four crimes itself um and and kind of and analyze the case those cases uh and then since then i've kind of gone the other route and done like a reverse profile where i've looked at a specific individual uh offender or suspect and uh and analyze it kind of backwards as well so the, i mean this whole there's so much to unpack here um obviously there's there's many things that stand out just the the number of uh, serial rape, serial sexual assault uh, events, I guess you could say, or series in such a small area um, in a small uh, time frame. Um, you have that. You have the fact that you have quite a few victims in here that are young and were abducted and released, which obviously we doesn't lose. happen. We lose. Everything's fine as far as I can see. What's up? Am I, good? Am I, Let's get on land. I can oh, hear you. Doug. You're back. We're good. He was never gone. Anyway. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. So you have a lot of things that stand out there. So I'll just quickly, I'll go through the maps as Alex or as post them up. So that's the first map there. It's just showing quickly the, uh, the four um, kind of cases that are considered to be Mr. Cruel uh, in red. And that's the convex hall, just showing where they took place. And then the green um, is the is the convex hall for the the release sites. Obviously, the uh, the first one was at her home, and then you had two sites where the the victims were released. And then the pin up in the top left corner there uh, is where uh, Carmen Chan's body was found. Uh, this is just showing just for people who may be new to your show or new to geographic profiling. It's simply showing the old uh, circle theory, which is the giant circle connecting the furthest points. And then the new theory of the convex hull, which is just a more accurate depiction of where the crime, the activity, uh, the space of the offender is. So... Perfect. So I'm, I'm, you know, I thought I would put up some slides here, just going over a few of the theories that the police had, um, a few of their search uh, tactics, and uh, and a few theories that have come up since. So this one first is about the, you know, the the theory that the two girls heard planes um, frequently landing or taking off. Uh, so these are the areas that the law enforcement searched. Um, you know, all those all those pins there, Keeler East, Keeler Park, Airport West, uh, and the other a couple others there. That was the area that the law enforcement searched uh, relative to uh, Tullamarine or the Melbourne Airport, uh, which is those areas are all just south of the airport. Now this is a this overlay here is a map I pulled off of uh, the Melbourne Marvels um they they put together it's a podcast and they put together this map and i have to give them a bit of credit in that their google map had a lot of points of interest so they've done a lot of research on this mr cruel case yeah. um the reason i've overlaid this map is because here they show your north south and your east west landing strips at the melbourne airport and i just emphasized it with that blue cross in the middle um so you can see why that the law enforcement searched to the south and if we go to the next map now these are the actual landing and takeoff patterns from that airport um so anybody that works with air traffic or ballistics they know that anything can affect something traveling through the air so time of day humidity wind um sunlight uh precipitation um, so 
depending on all these different factors and obviously where the plane is coming from and taking off too, these planes are taking off and landing, taking off is the green and landing is the red from different directions. Um, so the whole point of this map here is to show that it's not just simply east and west, north and south, that there's so many areas that these girls could have heard loud planes coming in at, 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 uh, and flying at low levels. Uh, this map you already saw. Uh, again, it shows the crimes relative to the substations. Now, one thing I've started doing in my profiling, uh, and it's something that I probably should have done a long time ago, but I never did. And I've started to put together a spreadsheet. And what's on that spreadsheet is your, your typical things found in any urban center um, so, or metropol metropolitan area. So for example, schools, bus stops, um, shopping malls, um, you name it. And what I've done is I've, uh, I've started to put down the average distance that humans live from these areas in urban centers. Um, now, most of my data comes from the U.S., but it is pretty universal uh, for, for most countries in terms of their urban centers. And now the, the point of that is that I didn't have substations on there. So now I'm, I've added substations after just talking with Alex today. Uh, right. Yeah. So electrical substations are on average uh, one to two miles from every person's home in an urban center. So they've identified five on here. But my next slide will show that just a quick search of Melbourne... Okay, before we get there, this is who controls. Yeah, you can go to the next slide, Alex. So this slide here just shows the different companies that control the different zones for the electric power grid in Melbourne. So right there, you can see that it's spread out. It's not in not all in one zone. So for example, it's not all. A, it might not. It's not necessarily like a a worker from City Power or Osnet. It's all spread out. And then the next slide will show all those yellow pins are just in a five minute search. Um, the substations that I found. So there's far more than that in that in that uh, Melbourne area. Um, so picking out those five and saying that, you know, this person's going to be an electrical work, could be an electrical worker and being very confident in that is, is very tough to do because you got to look at the greater picture and say that, okay, everybody in that city lives one to two miles from one of these substations. So, Doug, you're saying that it would be wrong to conclude like, well, he must be a waiter because everyone lives near a restaurant when there's just restaurants all over the place anyway, that kind of thing. Yeah, you need something else to go along with that. I right. mean, just saying that every that each crime is two miles from mm. a substation. Yeah, right. but I can I can tell you right now that every one of those crimes is like I said, is five minutes from a bus station is it must is be a bus driver, probably right? five minutes from a shopping mall, right? Is two miles from a school. So it's right. just it, in a case it reminds me of is the uh, the one where the boys are drowned. I think it's in Wisconsin. And they said, well, we keep finding these smiley faces and therefore it's a serial killer. But no one's ever like thought, well, how many smiley faces are just in any given area if you if you go looking for them? Yeah. Sure. I think that's Pennsylvania. I think that's uh, New I Pittsburgh. It's, it's nationwide, I think. Is I it think nationwide? A, Is that a theory it? Okay. That, yeah. that it's going on all over the country. Gotcha. Right. gotcha. Right. So it's either a yeah. smiley face killer cult or people drown <laughs> and people paint smiley faces in a lot of and Smiley faces are, you know, for generations have been one of the most common tags, sure. you know. Mm -hmm. Anyways, Doug. Uh, okay what's next there alex all right so these are uh again some of the the cases that we have here that alex and uh and morph have already gone over um we have the the hampton the two sexual assaults um in hampton in 1985 the purple uh polygon there is the 85 to 87 and then the uh, the orange up top there is the uh, the three in December 1985. Um, so I just want to show them in relation to each other, and we'll get more into each one of them. 
Uh, actually, just go back, Alex, quickly. Should have zoomed in on that, maybe. So the – actually, no, we can go forward. Sorry about that. We can go forward. Okay. Uh, so looking at Brian Allen Elkner, uh, he was obviously convicted of the the – sexual assaults of those one two three four five six was it six or seven six six women um down in the brighton area uh you can see with the blue convex hall there and the points there um and you can see that uh elkner lived just south of there in hampton uh with his wife pearl um, at that time he was working at melbourne university now he also did his uh BA, a double major in English and French at Melbourne University as well, uh, prior to that back in the 60s. So he's very familiar with the Melbourne area. Uh, he did live after completing that. He lived over in uh, the Sydney area. Um, he actually left the Sydney area just before the Bondi Beast uh, started uh, committing rapes in the Sydney area. Um, but he did live over there. But he's very familiar with the Melbourne area. Now, what I showed there is the routes that he took from home to work each day in white. One of those two white routes is the uh, is his path to and from work. And he kind of has a, uh, a Gary Ridgway thing going on there where his attacks are on his route to and from work. Now, I don't know off the top of my head the time of day, but it's just on the path. So his his activity space is on that route as opposed to around his house or is around his work. It's on the route to and from work. Uh, this just shows a close up of his, uh, again, where he committed his, um, the rapes he was convicted of, the sexual assaults he was convicted of, and then where he lives. Now, as Alex mentioned, he, was convicted for 10 years in 1974 and he got out in 79, 80. Now he was actually out on day, day release back in starting in 77 running marathons. Uh, he started marathon running in prison and he kept that going. It looks like through to at least 1985 or longer. Um, so when he got out in 79, 80, then you have, a time frame of 80 to 85 where there's there's no known cases in the area or that I could find at least. But then in 85, you have the two abductions uh, in Hampton. One was 0.3 miles from his house and one was 0.4 miles from his house. Uh, and both of those abductions were, again, the 14-year-old boy and the 14-year-old girl. And they were both released uh, very similar, well, in the same in the same way as the the mr cruel cases that uh that we're looking at um back that we're looking at in the in the later years there so it's also interesting to note that and i'll get to this when we talk about the mr cruel cases that both of his victims or well whoever the hampton rapist was they released both of their victims within three miles of their home and that's important because in the Mr. Cruel case, the the two girls were also released within three miles of their homes. That's interesting. And here's the 85 to 87. It overlaps the same area. Uh, now, I have no information on those uh, victims. They're all unknown victims as far as I could uh, see. Obviously, the law enforcement, has, uh, law enforcement would have that information, but it's not doesn't seem like it's public anywhere. Um, so a couple, just a couple interesting things, points here is that one, it overlaps his previous crime, uh, uh, activity space. Uh, it's one victim was, um, assaulted right near within, you know, half a mile, mile of his home. And then the one victim, the Cofield victim was also abducted and released as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, now in 1985, at some point in 1985, around that time, uh, I couldn't find the exact date that he divorced, that him and Pearl divorced, uh, but Pearl did leave him at some point during that time. And in 1985, after those, uh, 
I'm not sure exactly the month in 1985, but later in 1985, he did move up to Thornbury, which is the house up top there. Um, I guess it says, yeah. So he moved north to in Melbourne to Thornbury. And again, in 1985, after moving north to Thornbury, you have the three December attacks in 1985 that happened of the, the women in their 30s. I think we should note that those December attacks took place on December 4th, December 6th, and December 7th, mm -hmm. kind of rapid fire attacks, whereas Mr. Cruel is, you know, waiting a year or so in between. You said women. How old are they? 30, 30 to 5, 30, mm. 30 to 35 and 34. And they were assaulted in their homes. That goes against our profile, Alex. If yeah. we were still committed tight. to that whole germaphobe used up thing, then yeah. And also yeah. the the frequency of the hits stood yeah. out to me. As I don't think, fitting. I don't think it's him. And he's focused on victims in their 30s. Mr. Cruel's focused on young girls. So well, like the, in the February and July 85 attacks, the Hampton attacks, the girl was 14. But then, you know, Lee said that this guy might definitely be a preferential offender. He, this, the Hampton guy took a boy of 14. Yeah, I don't think and they're those the are same. both abductions and sexual yeah, assaults. Because every time Mr. Cruel has a choice, he can, he can take younger kids. I, I don't know if there are any boys present in some of these, Alex. Do you remember? In there, there was. Were, there were, there yes. Was. Okay, he can in take which? he can take fully uh, one of oh, the yeah, brothers. That's I think. right. Yeah. He can there was take a seven year old brother. He can take adult women. He's scoping out a particular house for a period of time too. He's saying, "I choose yeah. this victim at this house," and he has this pick of any age yeah. group. Or in. so for him to consistently mm -hmm. be going for girls that age, I'm going to rule him out for for most other stuff. Uh, yep. Good point. Yeah. So, Doug, with that in mind, yeah. where do you think Mr. Cruel, where do you think this house is that he's uh, uh, taking people to? Well, uh, Alex, if you want to go to the next slide. Okay, so there comes in the Mr. Cruel um, attack sites, all right? The Mr. Cruel Convex Hall, uh, mm. which overlaps with those three in December 1985. Um mm -hmm. I'll come back to that question in a sec, Lee. Go to the mm -hmm. next one, Alex. Go ahead. And Doug, if you can, uh, can you describe this area or the name of this area for the audio listeners too? Uh, sure. So this is, so the Mr. Cruel, uh, the canonical four there took place, you know, around the Doncaster, Box Hill area. Um, Burwood is just south of there. Uh, so this this image that's up here right now, again, it shows the four attack sites for the Mr. Cruel. Um, and then that, so that area south, that area just underneath there, the circle um, with PLC in the middle, that's the Presbyterian Ladies College. So that's where the, that's where the two girls went, uh, Linus and Chan. They attended school there. They both attended school there. They're both 13 years old. Uh, now, when I was originally asked about this case, I was only looking at the four and I said that there was there was most likely an anchor point of some sort, whether it's a residence or work, um, in that yellow circle uh, around Burwood. Now, the reason that was so specific to me is because, I mean, for the two victims spread a, a fair distance apart to both go to the same school and have a Mr. Cruel uh, abducting both of them and also being interested in the school uniform that 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 was the that was the connection that that was probably going to break the case in in my opinion just looking isolating those four good thinking doug so this could be someone lurking around the schoolyard which he would do like we Correct. know he surveys the homes right yeah okay yeah. Mm -hmm. play devil's advocate though if you attack two children in the same you know certain area isn't there a good chance they would go to the same school? That Doug said uh, well, that, they were, that they were quite far apart, right, Doug? They, yeah, because hmm. Chan and uh, they were, I mean, they were uh, quite a distance apart. I mean, this was a, this was a private school. So yeah. you okay. had to, it, it accepted everybody, but you had to specifically enroll and pay to go to this private school. So, so not like a public school that everyone in that area specifically would go to. Okay, good. Exactly. Point. 
yeah, it wasn't regional based. You didn't have to go based on your, uh, you know, postal or zip code or whatever. So when I was looking at Elkner, when he moved up to Thornbury in 1985, uh, around 1988, he switched careers and he does, he started doing instructional videos for, uh, to educate, uh, employees in corporations. Um, and he also, and he taught at Deakin university, which is directly beside the Presbyterian ladies college. Huh. Uh, and he also worked at the, uh, center for adult education it used to be called the commission or whatever it was called but anyway center for adult education uh they have five different locations i believe and one of them is right there on his route to the uh to deacon university as well um so that that puts him in direct vicinity of that school uh now, this here, I believe, is probably the last slide. Um, those green points are everywhere that he was. So he was part of the Victorian Marathon, Victoria or Victorian Marathon Club. Um, he ran marathons and there was places they, they went as a club to, to train. Um, and you can see by those green points, the locations that he trained. Um, there's some that are obviously very close to different attacks from different uh, of those different series. Um, you know, the, the Cofield one in the 85 to 87, uh, the Wills attack, the, uh, the first attack in the Mr. Cruel series, we'll call Kate. Um, and the, but the, the, the interesting one, the most, the most interesting one to me was the the fact that he used to run in Edgar's Creek, where Carmen hmm. Chan's body was found? Okay, devil's advocate. Um, yeah. Mr. Cruel is described Shoot. by several witnesses as having a beer belly. If uh, someone's training for marathons, which I've never done in my life, and thus I have a beer belly, um, <laughs> are they going to have one of those? It, it unlikely. However appears uh, i i don't have all the details on it but it appears that most of his marathon running was done kind of between 1977 and that 85 time period mm. prior to the mr cruel attacks okay mm. but i again i don't have all the details on that okay oh that that makes sense so that college anchor point doug pointed out it's interesting you know if it's not him going there you know he's got a connection to the students could it be a janitor or someone that works here in some other capacity a different faculty member a chess teacher a parent mm -hmm. so it sounds like alex you maybe have something as a tidbit for suspects we do we have should we segue to suspects and see if any of them have a yeah. connection to this school yeah doug how much do you know about other suspects in the case i'm hoping you can you know uh, a, a little bit. I can maybe okay. comment comment here and there, but Elkner was the one that I that I focused primarily on. Sure. Be sure. Before so we get many, to the suspects, yeah. though, uh, Doug, did you pinpoint where you thought the the house was? Uh, no, I did not. That's okay. That's fine. Yeah. So a lot of the suspects, these seven people that are still on the list, um, are have not been identified publicly. But we do have the names of a few. And I don't know if this guy is actually on their list. But in 2020, a retired homicide detective named Ron Idles or Idles told um, the podcast Australian True Crime that he believed he knew Mr. Cruel's identity. He said that he received a tip from a, a criminal that police you know, knew very well um, about a child rapist that lived in in a house under the Eltham fight path. And the house, he said, had the same layout as the one described by Sharon. And so this is where it gets weird. So Idles, Idles dug a little bit and he discovered that this man was a successful business professional and that he often patronized the Chan's, uh, the family restaurant in Eltham and that he was an occasional cross dresser. Now in 2002, uh, Harold's son reporter published what he thought was the identity of the suspect. 
and it was a man named Norman Normy Leung Lee. He was an armed bank robber who died in 92 in a shootout. Um, the robbery went wrong and it was at the Melbourne Air airport. And this shootout took place three months after the, they found Carmen's body. Do you know anything about him, Doug? No, I'm not familiar with him. No, no. anybody. Mike, you covered this case on criminology, didn't you? I did. I didn't go that deep, and it wasn't recently, so I I don't know okay. anything about so, him offhand. Sorry, is this an Asian surname he has? Is this yeah, an Asian gentleman? It sounds Korean, Leung Lee. Yeah. Um. Well, do, do we think Mr. Cruel is Asian? I mean, I guess he could. Was there a mention? Was there a mention of skin color in any of the scriptures? Hey, I thought I remember. No. Yeah, I guess yeah. not. Um, but he's, I, I don't know, like, forgive me, he is described as, as be, being very hairy. I don't know very right. hairy right. Asian guys. And you'd think that that would stand out. Yeah, hmm. unless he was wearing a disguise, but That's then what I'm that wouldn't account for the dandruff. No, no it's not How impossible. Old he? It's, not, it's not impossible. Like, he? he could be Asian, but there's nothing that we would, to say that, you know, where we'd think he would be. What right. was this guy's age range during the uh, Mr. Cruel attacks? Do you know? Don't know. I'd have to look it up. Yeah. Be curious to see if he's an older guy that might have gray hair or if he's. Uh, no, he had very, very dark hair. Hmm. Um, he actually, to me, I wish I, I didn't do a picture. Yeah, hold on right there. So this is important, Citizen Detective. I believe Lung Lee just did time with a guy who could fast. Okay, that's. So that's. um. So he might have repeated those details. Yeah, possibly. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of more, some interesting information on Elkner, but we'll come back to that. Um, so okay. this one, go um, ahead. Mr. Cruel is uh, described as, um, he, he sounds uneducated. Of course, you can fake that once again. He swears a lot as well. Um, I'm just wondering and he's got an Australian accent. Are these things that this this suspect Long Lee that we can say about him? Don't know. That was all literally all I could find on him. Okay. Um so there was a woman that has been trying to correspond, trying to get police and such to listen to her that she believes she knows who he was knows where the house were. She it sent like a 6,000 word statement to Crime Stoppers. Um, she's been dismissed by everyone. But we don't know anything about the information she provided. Uh, she spoke to this detective, Ills. Um, he kind of dismissed her too. And what's interesting, even if you want to dismiss her, is that there is a man named Christian Bennett who was once a suspect in this case and he believes that they should really listen to this woman. Um, he was a suspect because he was a chess teacher at Presbyter Presbyterian ladies college. And one of my sources says that he taught both Linus and Carmen Chan. Um, they looked at him early on, not just because he was a teacher at PLC, but also because he t spoke both Cantonese and Mandarin, um, traveled was quite a, an Asia file, traveled to China quite a few times and was dating a Cantonese woman at the time of the abductions. But supposedly police cleared Bennett um, because he had al alibis. But I thought it was really interesting that this guy is still so committed to, he says he's researched this case ever since. And to me, it's it smells of someone who's inserting themselves into the investigation, which would be something that this, you know, on the verge of an expressive transformative offender would be doing. Yeah, I, what so I has like anyone about, heard the, the, about Christian Bennett? Go ahead. Oh, just has as anyone who's covered this case before? Do they know anything about this Christian Bennett? I think he had alibis for the. For right. two of the four, correct? That's what it, I found. Yeah. And he may be inserting himself into the case, but sometimes people do that. We know that, you know, in the Zodiac mm -hmm. case, Arthur Leal and everything screams that he's not Zodiac, but he sort of basked in that glory of mm -hmm. attaching himself to the case. So maybe this guy is just someone that got enthralled once he sort of was mm -hmm. suspected. Alibis or alibis. 
If you're alibi, yeah. you move on. So yeah. right. you, you can come back, but for now you move on. Yeah. So we talked about the electrical worker theory. Um, some interesting stuff I found about Elkner. Wow, this guy. Um, in the 70s, he wrote an essay called Diderot and the Sublime, the artist as hero concept. And he was inspired by French Enlightenment thinker, Denis Diderot. And he, his essay basically posited the theory that the great criminal, you know, the uber criminal is like an artist and should be revered as a hero. And um, he, you know, how Lee, do you think that would play? Do you, do you think that would play into this guy's whole personality and developing this criminal personality and behavior? Yeah, I th I think it could fit. I think it, like just generally, yes, uh, because we talked about how um, the whole craft of it seems to be a, a big motivation for him. Right. Uh, someone who saw himself as an artist, I would think would uh, might write letters or phone calls, which we said we felt this guy want um, wanted to do. But maybe when he says artist, he's talking more about the craft of it, the execution. Yes. Than the expression yes. of it. So, yeah, um, I'm not saying yeah. that that's a bullseye, but it's. It's interesting that he would that he would say something oh, his, like that. I don't know. Doug, is Elkner still alive? Yes, he's still alive, yeah. He is still alive. Because I yeah. know uh, in 2015, he spoke to A Current Affair, um, the Australian version of A Current Affair. And his response to being still considered a suspect is that the police always knock on his door um, when a sex offender is on the streets. Yes, they do. And that happens to people. Um, he claims that he has since rehabilitated his life and has a family. And this is interesting to me. Um, this really stood out that when he was interviewed, he made statements that suggested that, you know, the damage done to the victims was about equal to the damage that was done to his life. Um, and that uh, the first person mm. I could think of was Diane Downs, who's like, but what about me? I have a broken arm. I have, you know, I have a hurt arm, yeah. you know, drawing parody between, if that's the right word. Carla Homoka. Where... Yes, that's yes, another, yes. Another one Absolutely. Enough about Kristen and Leslie. Enough has been written about them. What about my struggles? What about me? What about yeah. me? Yeah. yeah. So at the very least, we know yeah. we have a narcissistic offender oh, yeah. with Elkner. But not necessarily the, the actual... Oh. Mr. Cruel, though. That's oh, he thing. looks good. He looks good. It'd be fun if we had a spreadsheet of all these people so we could take the profile and like triage them. How old was he during the first Mr. Cruel attack? Oh, he he was uh, he was born in when was he born? I find it. And while Alex is looking that up, I'm curious. Did did you say that 42? he had a record before 40, 42? He started. I pitching? think he was born in forty two. I think he got his BA in sixty one or sixty two. Yeah, huh. I think he was born the, in forty two. And the first attack was eighty seven. Oh, so he's right on the at very far age range of my profile. Yeah. Right. Did he have a record before he started teaching? Did Not he do that some I crimes? Remember. Okay. For some reason, I thought I remember you saying that he had a. But it, prior to that. it would be interesting to look in to see if there's any unsolved cases of sexual assault in New South Wales around where he lived. Right, mm. right. In Sydney. Yeah. Well, you because did mention they started that after he got his job at the university. And you did mention that 1960s ransom note was the same dollar amount. Was that in the same vicinity? I'm not sure on that one. Hmm. Not sure. That was a boy. Was that for a boy? No, that was one of our um, commenters. That that was who mentioned that. Okay. Mm. Yeah, but I think that was for a boy. Drew, can you pull that up again? And so, hold hold on though. So our um, the guy we're talking about, Elkner, did he offend against males? I didn't. I no. Don't think so. No, the no. ones he was convicted for were yeah. all women. Yeah, so we're in danger here of stitching things together because we want them. Mm -hmm. to, well, he could be the Hampton yeah. rapist or something, and so you, yeah. yeah. Um, and he doesn't seem like a preferential offender, Elkner. 
Um, but was that, he potentially in that area and heard, you know, that figure or that number being reported? And he would have been, if he was born in 42, so this is in 1960. So not saying he kidnapped that boy, mm. but was, like, I don't know where we're talking geographically, but, you know, was he in that area that he would have heard the news reports and, and be mm. privy to that? It's also not an extremely rare number. Like with the Ramsey case, you have 118,000. Yes. It's really specific. 25 specific. is like one of those ones. You just fire that off, right? Right, right, yeah. right. And it could be in going with Lee's profile that if this, if he was offending against women and he did have a few young preteens and teenagers in there or teenage, young teenagers, then maybe that is when he decides older women are too much of a pain in the ass or they're dirty or whatever, and then moves to just children. Is How that common possible? is that? Is that commonly? Does someone have that victim type and then say, I'm going to shun this victim type and then go to this victim type? How often does that happen? It happens, but it's more the exception than the rule. You know, it's quite rare. Hmm. Um, it'd be rarer if he flipped genders, I think, but, uh, but maybe not with I don't know, man. To be honest with you, I'd be talking about my ass a bit. It's rare. Yeah. Yeah. Do they have uh, in the UK or in Australia? Excuse me. Do they collect uh, sex offenders DNA? Anybody know that offhand? Because so I'd be curious if his DNA is on file someplace. If they would they, automatically compare that to they any potential have DNA them. in in this yeah. case. It's so I'm I'm pretty sure they do have a national database, but. Um, it depends on when it was collected. So that's kind of one of the issues that we have in our country is that, you know, we have these offenders that are arrested in the 70s, 80s, you know, and, and their DNA, even even to the point if their DNA was collected and typed using an older system, you know, using RFLP testing, which we don't do anymore, then, then you can't make the comparisons. Um, so that could be the case if, you know, we're talking about an early, an early time frame. You have a cuckoo clock. <laughs> my parents' house. Yes, I'm at my parents' house. And we've got, it's, you know, Aww. midnight. You're going to be hearing it for a while. There we go. The best part uh, of the show. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, if you, if you think about the time frame here in the late 80s, early 90s, even if DNA, even if this individual, you know, if it's Elkner, let's say, and he's arrested prior to that and they've, even if they collected, even if they had legislation in place to collect his DNA at that time, um, it, it not necessarily is going to be comparable. Uh, but now, if you have him as a viable suspect or anyone as a suspect, you really, again, you need to go back to that, uh, back to whatever evidence is, le is left and consider retesting now. Um, because I would suspect that in this case, we're probably not talking about semen. If there was, you know, if that was present, we, we would be able to figure this out, do genetic ge genealogy. So my expectation is that's not present, but there could be male DNA, low levels of male DNA. And if you have a suspect, even if you can't put it into CODIS, it's too low level or it's too much of a mixture or it's just uh, YSTR testing, you can compare that to a suspect. Oh, I, wanted to get, I wanted to get your opinion real quick, Cloyd. I know the FBI consulted on this. What do you think of the FBI not being able to solve this case? Oh, my God. Don't get me started. They're really good at posing. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be a show without, without talking about yeah, the FBI. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I did want to mention that or bring up the fact that his rapes, Elkner's rapes, he was convicted in 74. So none of that would be on file anywhere because that was way before any DNA, let alone databases. So they wouldn't even have that to compare to. The only semen that I'm aware of, Alex, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I believe in the ha the two Hampton rapes. I believe the, 14, the girl said that she told law enforcement that he she believed that he ejaculated inside of her. And I think there was a semen sample from that. But if I recall right, it was either lost or destroyed. So I think that was the only semen sample and, at the time. Yeah, I don't know about that one. But And all I know about um, 
Where is it? Was it her? There was one one of the victims. They, they and, in it. the lower plenty victim. Um. Oh, was it the lower plenty? Was it Kate? That's the one oh. I'm talking about. Okay. Um. So they had DNA. They lost the samples. There That's... was a rope used mm -hmm. on the lower plenty victim that they put in a plastic bag, but they lost it. He did ejaculate inside her. And if it's still in existence, it would be testable, but we don't know. Okay, that's yes. the one. What a lost uh, opportunity. And the, I don't know what the rape statutes were then if they were saying, okay, statute of limitations up. I don't know what they are in Australia back in, in that time. But, you know, during the East Area there Rapist were... case, for example, it was like five or six years. Then they threw everything right. out because they couldn't do anything. Yeah, the extended statute of limitations on sexual assaults and um, even life, you know, removing statute of limitations. Those are very recent phenomena in the, in the law. Back then, you had maybe five, maybe 10 years. Patricia Burns has a comment, and I think we should go to some comments now because we've been racking them up. So, Drew, if you could, if you could kind of rapid fire them up and then we'll try and um, answer them like a batting cage, right? Uh, and make sure you get uh, DDA members comments up there. Alex, you want to, you want to read? Let's yeah. Let's, yeah. Okay. This is from Patricia Burns, a longtime listener, oftentimes commenter. Hey, Patricia. So she says, Edward Paisnell broke into homes, took the child out and raped them and released them and was at large for 14 years and was caught by chance. Hey, where was that? I don't can you give us more information, Patricia? Yeah. Anyway, so so bring that one back up. Put it down, Drew. Um, put another one up, and if Tr Patricia has more info. Okay. Next. Penguin Vic says, the Watsonia electricity substation is not that close to the Lower Plenty home invasion, but the old abandoned Lower Plenty substation was used as, as impromptu electricity depot. It's a better fit. I think we're just Lots. moving on from the substations, aren't we? Because I, yeah, so. I think, I, I think to Doug's point, you know, there's uh, going to be some electrical connection. Yeah, and, and anywhere and you want, look, I want to make sure that. And I had to go back and read this several times, but this TV show under investigation, um, this was their project, their own investigation. It was not law enforcement's, um, so I don't know whether or not they even qualify. Um, I, or I don't know if there's any way we can really authentic, authenticate the work that they did. I feel like they're just kind of asking people to take their word for it. Hmm. Now, Patricia seemed to answer with Jersey to her yeah. previous point. Where's Jersey? I'm not good with my... Uh... It's a Channel Island, so it's... Um, That's what I thought. It's, it's like a British island. Before there was a New Jersey... There was a jersey, it was, so and that's from the old. others with Nicole Kidman, yeah. the uh, ghost movie from the nineties. I remember the the uh, Isle of Jersey there that the right. story took place at. Yeah. Um, oh, Ashley in the chat is calling him the Beast of Jersey. Hmm. So, uh, Patricia, is, is that comment to to say it could be him, or or that he could just be caught by chance? That it's a similar case. So, follow up on that. Um, his moniker was the Beast of Jersey. Yep, got it. Cheryl um, Burns just brought up uh, an extra, uh, an actually good comment too. If you could bring that back up, Drew. Some items were taken that were pretty specific, strange. pretty interesting. Also, some of the things he took were strange: the parka and the vinyl records of the London Philharmonic. Um, some. Uh, Law enforcement officers discussed the fact that they thought he might have been a lot like Richard Ramirez, a burglar first and a sexual predator, predator second. Um, and I, I thought maybe those because it was a collection of albums that he thought those might have value. Isn't that hard to transport, though, versus a pocket full of cash or a wallet or something? We don't know how big the collection was. It could have just been, you know, for we, we don't know how, how big it was. Mr. Cruel took those. Mm -hmm. I'm just being, I just want to clarify. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I mean, he's got to carry them to his car, which is probably parked within running distance, right? That was in the lower plenty attack. Um, possibly, yeah. We, we know, know he has a car because he, you know, so yeah. Um, you put them in a backpack or something, right? Um, 
Yeah, so I agree. Like, I mean, I think okay. I said that. In, I think I said that in the profile. Like, very well could I said he had priors for burglary. If he if he has priors, it's for burglary, one of them, and it's um, criminal sophistication shows uh, mm-hmm. that he probably has a, a criminal history in the past, which Cloyd backed me up on. So, yeah. So Penguin Vic has um, offers some interesting, a little bit more information about this record collection. They say that the stealing of four vinyl record set of a four vinyl record set is interesting as these were real budget price cheapies, a mix of basic popular classical se- selections for various orchestras and chamber mm. groups. So it's mm. not a high, but would he have thought they had value? I right. Don't know. Well, and that tells us something about him, right? Mm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Maybe it's just a souvenir. He could play those records and relive this crime every time. Oh, he has it could be. Record. And Whoa. Patricia just said that right here in a comment. Yeah. Uh, yep. When he listens to wow. it, he will always be reminded. Ooh. Ooh, you're giving me screenplay ideas. Okay. <laughs> hmm. Sharon Wills was released near 66 uh, kV high voltage subtransmission electrical wires that went to both Ringwood Terminal Station and Bayswater. Electricity substation. No, I'm guessing that's just a coincidence. Okay. Doug, you want to comment on that? No? Okay. I think we're past, like you said, we're past yeah, the substation we're, we're, theory. We're, yeah, we're, no, for, for the substation theory, I, w- I would need more to go on than just... Right. Yeah. Yeah. Rebecca Casella says, okay. did parents have to pay for their private school? Was the tuition expensive? Um. I would assume. Don't know. No, no. A private sc- girls' school. I would. I mean, with a chess teacher. They may have vouchers. They mm. may have. Yeah, yeah they I may have scholarships. But yeah, these, Vic... these were not destitute parents. These were not low-income parents. Yeah, mm. and Penguin Vic here is filling in that. Yeah, unless they were scholarship holders, they would have had to pay top dollar for tuition fees. Mm. And both students were highly intelligent, and it was a good school with a good record. So it seems like a a place that you either had to get into with tuition or pay a decent amount of money to go to. Hmm. Rebecca Casella says, did they ever find any of the cars he supposedly stole? I don't think he stole cars. That no, was misinformation again. Yeah. And he I, was I embarrassed wanted... that his car didn't yeah. start. And yeah. yeah. I want to note that the sample, the photo that I put up of the, uh, the Commodore vacationer, um, I, I just looked up to see what one looked like. I was thinking a big wagon, but here this picture comes up of a 1985 with three blue, you know, uh, lines of piping on it. Mm. Now, two of the victims said the car sounded older because it wouldn't start right away. So maybe that's not exactly what the car looks like. But that's why I said it was just an example of what an 85 Commodore or a there... would look like. They're noting that the car doesn't start right away. He's thinking, oh, man, they're going to say that. They're going to tell someone Mm -hmm. that, you know, my car doesn't start easily. And so then he goes, "Um, good thing I stole this, right? Right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So should we take one more comment and then bring Ashley on up? Uh, Let's take take three more, though. Let's but let's wrap up fire them. Okay. Rebecca Casella, did they ever? No, we did that. Okay. Move on to the next comment, Drew. Patricia, Edward was a builder, but his wife ran a home for kids local to the houses he broke into. And that's the Hmm. Beast of Jersey? Yes. Okay. Bing. Next. Drew says, actually, we don't have any more comments. Okay. Cool with me. Okay, then. So Ashley's coming up. Then we'll move on to the scrum. We'll talk about, so yes, we we'll talk about the scrum. Some more suspects. Mm. No, that those are it for suspects. So we're just oh, we're find gonna, something to talk yeah. about. Oh, before yeah, Ashley sure. comes on next week, Alex. Or uh, sorry, next. Um, ah, yes. Um, so we we've, we've got it together, and next week we are going to start covering the Oklahoma series of unsolved cases. Um, the head of the very brand new Delaware County cold case unit, uh, Stephanie Bishop is going to be joining us. And so next time we're just going to be doing an episode where she's going to give us an overview of these cases. And from that point, we'll be proceeding to take each case one by one. 
And several of these cases are very, very connected or possibly they have a lot of connections. I wouldn't say necessarily that they're connected. So I think that's going to be a really exciting series of cases to explore. Very much looking forward to that. And you guys are going to love Stephanie. She's great. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'd like to thank our new digital detective agents, Lauren J, Roxanne H, Jenna M, Gary M, Megan JD, and Joshua B. Remember that our agents keep this podcast afloat. If you're considering joining their ranks, here's the info. The Nancy Drew tier gives you ad-free episodes, bonus content, and the Scrum. The Scrum is an after-hours with our hosts and guests where the conversation continues. The Colombo tier contains the perks of the first, plus a guarantee that at least one of your comments or voicemails will be heard on the show. The Poirot tier contains the perks of the first and second, plus access to a quarterly private session where members will join and interact or one or more hosts to discuss cases not explored on the show. Think of it as a masterclass where you and the host dig even deeper into your pet case. The fourth and final is Sherlock Holmes, which contains all perks so far, plus a VIP pass to any special in-person event where you can meet and hang with the hosts of Citizen Detective. As we grow, there will be a lot more coming your way. Watch this space. Head on over to www.patreon.com slash Citizen Detective. Citizen Detective streams every two weeks on YouTube at Citizen Depod on Twitter, at Citizen Detective Podcast on Facebook, and twitch.tv slash Citizen Detective. Back to the show. Thanks, Ashley. So as soon as everyone comes up, we will head into the scrum. I hope uh, listeners are going to join us. And thanks to all the patrons yeah. that already are part of the DDA and, and already plan on joining us. But anyone else that wants to come over the scrum, you can uh, sign up and, and take part in the conversation. It keeps on going after we wrap up with the regular episode. I feel like everybody abandoned us. It's just you and no, I. No, just you and I. I think we're alone now. <laughs> oh, there's who oh, she's I'm there, here, but she's getting ready gone. to go. Yeah. Well, okay. I have to. Uh, I've got. I'm on East Coast time. I'm at more fun. I'm with you here. Oh. So, yeah. But I have a uh, court tomorrow. Zoom, just Zoom uh -oh. court. But still, got to do that. So I think I'm probably gonna. Unless there's any burning DNA <laughs> questions that did not get covered. I'm probably going to head on out. Oh, uh, you're on mute, Chloe. I can't hear you. I just said, can you explain DNA? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> DNA is, yeah. <laughs> I'll be, I'll start be with the tomorrow. double helix in mm -hmm. 1920. Yeah. Mm -hmm. nope, nope, I'm tomorrow. so glad you could make it. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Glad I could. My, uh, my dad, um, so my, my parents' house, and my dad is one of our... Um, avid listeners so he's usually uh -oh. he's usually listening in so he was thrilled he was like in the den listening while i was out here <laughs> so, uh, he was, sticking his nose in <laughs> i know yeah, I know. really he's, yeah no he should have let him crash uh, crash and come in and wave and mm -hmm. i know uh -huh. i know he, he he said he was gonna like walk <laughs> in the background <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh -huh. <laughs> but yeah all right all right guys well, well yeah i think i'm heading more. out Thank Good you. trip. Uh, Good court nice. morning. Thanks. Tell Dad Thank I said much. hi. Uh, I know. Well, you're a Facebook friend. So no, you we can are just tell Facebook him friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. I'll well, take care. Have a good night. Night, Susanna. Bye, bye, bye guys. So, as you guys so think are we that that Elker guy? I, think I don't it very know. Well could be. Yeah. Are we in the scrum? We are in the scrum. We are in the scrum. We are in the scrum. Just want to make sure. Okay. I think he's good for some of them. I think he's good for the the Hamptons for sure. 
But not for Mr. Cruel, perhaps. Uh, yeah, it's tough to say. I think he's... I, I, I think he's good for the Mr. Cruel ones, mm. just based on where he moved to at that time and the fact that, you know, along with the Hamptons, they're all the two Hampton rapes the same age. They're both abducted and released. Mm -hmm. They're both released within three miles. Uh, his proximity. I think he's good for the Hamptons and the Mr. Cruel. And then I wouldn't rule out the other two series either. I know that the, I'd be interested to find out what the age range of the 85 to 87 ones are. Uh, let's see. We don't, we don't uh, know that it's not released. Yeah. I, yeah. They're just unknown victims. Right. Unknown victims. I mean, assault. we don't even know that they're all female. I don't think we do. Right. We don't unknown. It's just unknown victims. Right. Um, but his confirmed victims are in their thirties, right? Uh, Not all of them. We've got a fourteen-year-old girl and a fourteen-year-old boy. Those are the Hampton. No, the, his 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 initial string, his initial series. Oh, his initial string. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah there yeah. was. No, no, no. Where is it? The ones that we know he did for sure were in their thirties. I thought Six you said girls. I think at least one of them was a teenager. Uh, I have. Details of victim unknown. So between the ages of 14 and 18 was one of them. I, yeah, I got age ranges for them. It looks like most of them are between 14 and 18. So okay. sorry, what's this MO? How does he approach those girls? Do you know anything about that, Doug? Because I wasn't able to find anything. Uh, because maybe in so it, so he. Go ahead. If the MO is different, maybe in the Mr. Cruel cases, he's picking like his premium, right? He's really saying this is what I ideally want. Whereas if the MO for this other rapist is more opportunistic, he's taking what he can get. Mm -hmm. Right. I guess based on court records, it just indicates that he's charged with assault with intent to rape. The, vic the mm -hmm. details of those victims are unknown, except that they were all between the ages of 14 to 18. Uh, Rebecca wants to know, did the four victims have anything in common besides age? Yes. Oh, the four the four um, canonical mm -hmm. victims. Canonical? So yeah. she uh, two we mentioned that Carmen and Nicola went to the same school. Yeah. But what about the other two? Could there be anything else that... We don't know them? anything about Lower Plenty. Hmm. We don't know much about that, anything about that victim other than the basic facts, so we can't really tell. Mm -hmm. And just like with, with trying to zone in on Elkner, for me, without knowing anything about the unidentified, the not the suspects that are not been publicly identified, we can't do a compare and contrast who fits it better. So I and really can you, can't. Can you refresh my memory? I, I know we mentioned three or four, I thought it was three or four victims that were in their 30s. That wasn't Elkner? We don't know who... That was that, 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 that's unsolved. Those three so another series but of rapes, but Elkner's confirmed victims. Oh, are they're 14 to, eight, 14 to 18. Okay, well, yeah, that's that's definitely, but even that the age range for most of the girls in the Mr. Cruel are prepubescent or around pubescent, but 13, not developed, like, not 10, developed 11, to, and yeah, then pubescent. So that's, that's a preteen, and, that's preteen. But two of them That's were 13, different. and let's say his first series, like, we don't know. Like, five of them could have been 14 and one eighteen, yeah. mm -hmm. right? So it just says yeah. 14. Like, right. We don't know that range. But I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm picturing, like, uh, a 10 to 12-year-old range is preteen. to in, in my eyes, 14-year-old, you're getting into teens. You're getting into older, more developed girls. I think there might be a tight difference between those girls. Now, obviously, they could look older than they are or something like that. That could affect. But well, I, I get the feeling Mr. Cruel is a target younger girls. Well, it's it's interesting because Sharon Wills, and I just found this out today, she was very small for her age. Um, she was not developed at the at the same age of um an eleven year old. I think they said mm. she was built more like a six year old. So she in height might have been, and right, so she, she was really tiny. Her, 
he might have looked at her as a younger girl thinking she was younger than she actually was. So to me, I'm getting a feeling this is a pedophile that's targeting preteen girls, not older teen girls, but that's that's just my gut but feeling. If, you, if you just like if you just look at Elkner's the ones he was convicted for, like he's showing his range of victimology there because a 14 year old is so much different from an 18 year old. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, but so then again, I think I think an eleven year old is different from a fourteen year old. Absolutely, they, they, are, they are. The amount your body changes in that yeah. short period is just yeah, huge, absolutely. Right? And you can look at somebody um, like Joseph D'Angelo. He had victims in their forties, all the way down to twelve. He was just whatever he saw he yeah. was interested in. He didn't have a mm -hmm. specific type, so right. he was sort of odd. I think most of the time you could expect someone to have a type. That they target it. I don't know. I just get the feeling this guy is a pedophile targeting, you know, yeah, I, I think that girls he perceives as being preteen. Its technical term might be hebophile. Um, that's what I had on my, yeah. And I like what you said that he's in between, he's kind of going back and forth between. Well, he's he's oscillating in that range. Hebophiles, when they're they kind of start going through puberty, um, mm -hmm. pedophiles prepubescent, um. The question yeah. is like what is it that he's looking for it's it's you know because he's he's picking them out so yeah and the, and let's remember he called at least two victims by name when he went into the house mm -hmm. yeah, does he, he know that from um, talking them or does he know them because he's got some connection that's we don't know but in the lower plenty case he asked her what her name was and then called her something else yeah. So maybe he didn't stalk that particular victim in the same way. Which victim number was that? Uh, number one, lower plenty. Well, there you the go. Unidentified. Number one. But at the same time, he may have done been giving misinformation, you know, pretending he doesn't know her, going out of his way to not know her name. Could be. That he doesn't know. Do that doesn't all, he doesn't... did that stuff all the time, misdirecting yeah. with stuff that was just totally not true. He also doesn't abduct that one, right? So maybe he's taking right. it less seriously. Yeah. Yeah, quite possibly. And I think that after the first one, either because it was too close for comfort or he realizes at that point he'd like to take more time. Or just to see how long he can get away with it. Just escalating that way. And I wonder if it goes to the point where if he's got a significant other that person that partner is away and he says okay it, i'm going to abduct her and bring her to my house because now i have the house available to myself for three days or whatever and i wonder I, if that has comes into play something something else that some of the sources mentioned and i i don't think this necessarily comes from law enforcement it might um there's a suggestion that he didn't have a job because he did all of these things on weekdays when and could do all these things when he didn't have to be anywhere and that's not true one of them was a Saturday. Um, he did leave the house for periods of time, at least with, I think it was Nicola. So, yeah. but that, that, that speculation. Mm -hmm. You have to account for his resources too then, right? I mean, he yeah. drives a mm -hmm. car. He it seems to have a dwelling that he can go to. Um, he, he's able to buy things for these kits. He may have a gun. Like, yeah, it's right, possible. Huh? It's just using his parents' car in place and everything. But, you know, I'd say on balance, he's probably employed. And and going back to D'Angelo, I swore he was not going to be employed either. I thought he was a full-time criminal. And here he's a full-time police officer and mm -hmm. a full, married, kids. I mean, I mean, he's doing all well, of this while doing all the stalking and attacking. So but he, when, you know, did, when did D'Angelo get fired? He got fired in 79. I think it was 79. Okay. And he wasn't, you know, when people talk about him being a cop, it's not like he was a Russell Williams, that he was, you know, far up. He was a failed cop. Well, he, he was a cop that got busted. Before that, he was working a full-time job when he was yeah. stalking and raping seven days a week, and he was married. Okay. So, uh, you know, I think it just goes to show you, if you're dedicated enough, you can have a full-time job, a family, stalk, and attack. Oh, yeah. And and I, I still to this day when, I wonder when he slept because he was doing it so often. So this guy could be doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, that's what they said about Bundy, right? And that's what Ridgeway's wife said about him. I just don't understand how Gary had time. 
Sure. Like, um, yeah, it's their favorite hobby. Cheryl Birch says he just would need a non-traditional nine to five job. Airline pilot. That crossed my mind too. Um, one of the things I didn't mention is I, I thought if he did military, the most likely branch of the military would, military would be Air Force. That's uh, Russell Williams. I think Dennis Rader was mm -hmm. Air Force. Um, something what about, is it about the Air Force? I don't know. Is it like the, the technical prestige of it or something? I don't know. What did, Cloyd seems to, though. I don't know. I, don't I know. know. I, I mean, no. <laughs> the desire to be a jet pilot. Hmm. A military oh, yeah. jet pilot, that's quite a dream. You know, that's yeah, like... You're, you're you a small guy to do that, though. They're all small, because yeah. if you talk about yeah. fighter jets, yeah. their cockpits yeah. are very tight. Well, your you ass man too, to get mm -hmm. into the military in the U.S. anyway, are the highest for Air Force. You have to hi have the highest scores to get into the Air Force. Okay. Um, so intellectually, they're there. They're looking for a higher score mm. to get into the Air Force in any capacity, whether it's a, a pilot on um, down mm. to a guy that loads stuff on the plane. It's probably something to do with the prestige of it, then. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It's so hard to tell with these. I mean, if you look at the schedule or the time frame of when he committed these assaults, like other than those three, well, we don't know who committed those three in December, but. If we're looking at the time frames, it's it, like it, they could be doing anything. They could have any job, any schedule, and mm -hmm. they just they just decide to hey, once a month I'm going to go to work tired, or I'm going to take that day <laughs> off sick, yep. or like yeah, unless, same unless thing. there's an obvious pattern, yeah. It, you know, if they commit an attack once a month, you can't really yeah. deduce anything from that. No. And, and you really to... can't when the crimes are almost you know more than or close to a year apart. Yeah. Unless you have a yeah. suspect and you can look at their schedule and say, hey, yeah, you took true. these days yeah, off. Exactly. Yeah. It's just D'Angelo was attacking people at 11 o'clock at night, three in the morning, 630 in the morning. Um, so that you, there was no real pattern to it. And was he taking time off because of that? Or was he just continuing on his normal fitting, schedule? Fitting it into his uh, yeah. family schedule. and Did work he work graveyard? Somehow. I don't remember what his shift was. Um, because if, but, you, if you're in a patrol car, you can do a lot of things if you're working great. Yeah, I don't, you know, you know, I, I forget the details whether he ever did this while on duty. I know he wasn't wearing a police uniform um, right. from the description. So I'm thinking he was not on duty, um, which, again, I, I still wonder when he slept because he's got to have a marriage, see his wife mm. sometime. You know what I mean? He's got to go to work eight hours a day. He's finding time to stalk people and he's doing the attack. So I'm, I'm like, when did this guy sleep? It's still one of the things that puzzles me to this day. Yeah. And I, I get the you same vibe that talk. this guy is like him. You know, I think he's an Australian version of him uh, in many ways. It's not nowhere near as prolific as far as we know. And that is a big no. difference. Yeah. That's one thing I would like to mark. Um, yeah. Unless Peter, he has other victims we don't know about. Maybe he's got more victims maybe. out there that have been connected than he would be really pro prolific. Yep, yeah, could be. Um, Peter Vronsky, the more he found out about Richard um, Cottingham, he was discovering, like, that guy never slept either, right? He was just constantly tra um, trawling for victims. It was like uh, mistresses, work, mistresses, serial killer victims, rape victims, just constantly. I think there's something about like psychopaths, um, so at least some psychopaths where they just don't require as much sleep. Yeah, probably. I think that's yeah. true. Yeah. They're so pumped by where their actions and their, mm -hmm. their, their goals. And that's all they live for. That's all they think about, or at least in, at least for a day or two here and there. And then they sleep in between maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And if yeah. they have an OCD type personality, any anxiety that goes along with that, insomnia, anything that would disrupt that normal neurological pattern. Right. I just think it kind of like keyed up, like not manic, yeah. but, but some like a little like cocaine mm -hmm. or something. And like, and they start yeah, going exactly. and I'm like, yeah, I got to sleep now. And then they fall asleep, like eating a sandwich in the rape victim's house or something. It's strange. Yeah. 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 Um, on top of being preoccupied with all their other activities, like I just don't think you could put so much weight on on sleep because, like, 
I don't know about the rest of you, but I sleep on average five hours a night. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I'm pretty lazy guy. (laughs) I I I sleep a good eight, nine hours. I have to. I wish. (laughs) All I caught was I'm a pretty lazy guy. Is that what you said, Lee? Yeah. (laughs) These guys are all, they don't don't sleep. I I don't get up. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I got up for this. I put on my great t-shirt. He's asleep right now. (laughs) Now, see me, I'll get carried away in reading, writing, going through reports and stuff, and then I'll look up, and it's like 3 o'clock. I'm like, oh, shit, I gotta go to bed. Oh, yeah. Because I gotta gotta get up with the kids at 7 o'clock. But then some nights, I'll go to bed super early. If I don't have anything going on, I'll go to bed at like 11 and wake up at 7, so. Yeah. If I stay up till 11, my husband, Steve, is like, whoa, you're still awake. Yeah, we have a little little party. Mm-hmm. So, speaking of kids, Rebecca asks the doc, "Do you think he had children of his own?" That's a good question. You know, he could have. I can't say either way, but it's not someone that that wouldn't have. I mean, he's able to he's able to meet women. I think, and so if you're able to meet yeah. women, and um, then every, if you're able to meet a woman, you can have a kid, right? Unfortunately. Um, well, as to whether let, you're responsible with them or not, yeah. Let me ask you this, Lee. So, given that this guy is attacking young girls, would this guy have impotency problems, stuff like that, with uh, adult women? Maybe, yeah, maybe it could be the the feeling of in- intimidation by their experience or like disgust, like we were talking about with um, Alex. Yeah. This, this idea that they're like used up or, um. You know, even some of them have weird things about menstruation, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, yes, yeah, there could be a number of things that that turn him off. In another life, when I was a sex crimes detective, I would find these people and they'd pit pedophiles, and they'd say, "I can't do that. I'm I'm impotent." Yeah, you're only impotent with an adult woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right or you may be impotent, right? yeah. but you didn't use your penis. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah. Well, they did use their penis. <laughs> so, they didn't. Oh, yeah. They, they, they are only impotent with adult women. They weren't impotent with children. Mm-hmm. No, impotence, is, impotence is weird, too, though. Like, I mean, if you're molesting a kid and you normally have a hard time getting it up, but like the kid doesn't know about this shit, right? Right. So it's like allows them to have a confidence or a lack of anxiety, which therefore can allow them to yeah. get yeah. hard where. Yeah. Right. What's the kid going to do? The kid's not going to tell anyone. The kid's no. not going to laugh. Makes me also wonder about a small penis going back to D'Angelo. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm wondering if there's any other crimes. And maybe Alex, when reading this, were there any other crimes theorized that could have been him in any other areas outside of this part? I didn't maybe see another anything. part of Australia. Okay. I, I mean, if, if there's if more you... out there on this case than what I found, then uh, I ask our viewers to bring it on because mm-hmm. I was really disappointed. Um, basically, other people's coverage and a few news reports, but I don't think you're yeah. going to find those additional cases. I mean, law enforcement might have some cases they're looking at, but unless you have a, a suspect. Because if you have a suspect and you see that they've moved across Australia or to another country, maybe you are looking at other cases, but publicly, no, I didn't come across any either. Okay. Well, and sometimes too, that's what's great about doing these round table discussions with our citizen detectives, because they're out there scouring newspaper articles, looking at cases that are similar Mm -hmm. in other areas. Somebody out there might have a suggestion of, Hey, you know, right after the crime stopped with Mr. Cruel, a very similar one popped up a year later in this city, 300 miles away or something like that. So um, it'd be worth looking to see if there's anybody out there that has any uh, similar cases yeah. they want to put forward in another yeah. area that, that could be him. Yeah. Okay. So I think, I think that's enough, Mr. Cruel. I think we've probably reached the end of that, right? I think Anything we didn't talk out. about. Yeah. So we're doing the uh, Oklahoma next time. We're starting the Oklahoma thing next time. That's going to be it's interesting. Be yeah. So we're going to go through some of the cases and and we're going to we're going to talk about what we're going to be exploring, and mm-hmm. it's, it's like a preliminary session, and yeah. maybe we can we can choose which ones we want to tackle first. Sounds hmm. good. Yeah, there's there's some interesting ones. 
A few of them seem to be uh, connected. Mm -hmm. But not in the ways that Mr. Cruel is connected. And right, right. Yeah. How many cases are, have they presented to you? She gave, oh. 17. Was originally. it 17? Because I'm confusing it with Doug's map, numbers of maps. No, um, I, think I think it was 17, 17. cases. Um, there are some that have absolutely no information. She's been trying to collect reports and there is nothing new. So she's going to be eliminating those. And we met last week and have settled on, or not settled on, but we've come up with the ones. She's told me which ones have full details that we can actually get a good narrative and a good idea about what the case is about. So we'll I'm always frustrated there. when I hear that police officers today don't have any police reports to work with from police officers from 20, 30 years ago. It's, Let me tell you what, it's, it can be a net. Well, first of all, you get just a mess of papers that are not in the chronological order mm. and yeah. individual statements and stuff. And, and that's what I'm dealing with, with the reports. They're not, oh my God. you know, yeah, it's I'm like, used, I'm used to working with case books and you start here. Right. Yeah. To get a case well, book, back in the old days, start here in this, yeah. 1936. Yeah. Time. Mm -hmm. so I'm, gonna, call it a night? I'm not going to I think. Yeah, no. Just uh, what I was saying is that, that, like, um, I was doing some cases from Canada in the late '60s, and I literally had like handwritten notes from the detective. And I'm when I say notes, I mean on a notepad, so it wasn't even right. a full page. It's like, and then someone scanned it on a PDF, and you're like, you pull it up, and it's like, it's like eight words. Call yeah. Phil. <laughs> call phil um and then like you know shoes question mark like i have no idea i can't yeah. i guess it's better than no report you go looking for a report you can't find any report or you find mm. evidence you're looking for and that's gone how frustrating is that well i don't know if it is better than no report because with no report you just go well i can't work on this case <laughs> right? right but if, if you've got a pdf full of uh things that were photocopied from the uh from the sixties or seventies and you spend all this time looking mm -hmm. through and you're like, you know, it could be hours before you go, this is collectively useless. Yeah. It's so yeah, frustrating. We're talking because... about a tiny little jurisdiction mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's frustrating because sometimes fresh eyes looking at it years later, somebody catches something that, Hey, they missed this or it makes sense now. So you want to have that stuff there. If you can, it's, it's frustrating. And that's what her team there. of investigators is trying to do is look at everything with fresh yeah. eyes. I mean, when they first yeah. get these cases, you know, I, you don't want to always put it down to neglect. It could be that they're pretty gung ho. It could be like, all right, let's get out and solve this. Um, not thinking that they're not going to, or that's going to be particularly tricky. And then they don't, they don't document it all properly, and mm -hmm. you know, and things get moved around. There's interdepartmental politics and bureaucratic restructuring. And the next thing you know, they're not on the case anymore, or there's another one that's come along and they've gone chasing that the now the dog chasing that car and then that stuff mm -hmm. gets left behind and yeah so it, really to do it properly the the cost would be overwhelming yeah, yeah. each one is like a research project right like a a, a giant mm -hmm. um like a, what you would spend on like a, a massive scientific project mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you can't do that oh. oh and most most departments just do it in the in the downtime between homicides because they don't have dedicated cold case units mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. yeah so as soon as a new homicide comes up they have to leave it aside and they have to work the actual like a, the new homicide that's just happened or whatever you know and the more crime goes up and their funding stagnates or goes down the worse it gets yeah yeah, yep. and that's that's why it's good in like this oklahoma instance that we're talking about that they're willing to you know try something different something outside the box yeah maybe yeah. turning over some stuff to us and asking our citizen detectives to brainstorm you never know what kind of ideas might come up and do they have a dedicated out. a dedicated cold case unit it's brand new um it's it's interesting because one of the reasons they they started this uh stephanie actually does not work for delaware county she is a prosecutor uh tribal prosecutor in the area. I can't remember which tribe. Um, and she and one of her investigators 
tribal investigator and some other people that were sitting around chatting and realizing that uh, listening to a lot of podcasts on missing indigenous people, that some of their victims weren't being included in that because they were listed as Caucasian when they're actually tribal. Mm -hmm. And so they were getting missed. And so they were all just kind of shooting the shit one day. And some of the cops were like, why don't you head this up? And so they put it together. And with the blessing of the sheriff and the assistance of the sheriff and the Oklahoma beer or state police, whoever. And so they are devoted to that. And she's got quite a team of retired officers, detectives, investigators who are committed to doing this. So, yeah, what we want to do is we want to use this um, to for fundraising for DNA testing. I mean, that's the, the best thing that you can do, right? That's a part of it. But also to, uh, tips as well. I mean, th some of these cases... People on the periphery of it have probably been thinking about it their whole lives, right? It's the murder or something that happened around mm -hmm. them, and no one mentions it. So it gets out there for the first time, and hopefully it'll get some new eyes on it, and it, might, it could lead to some tips. And then in the process, we get to do some behavioral stuff, and Doug, hopefully you're going to join us where you can for that, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, sure. you know, so the worst thing that happens is we get some shows out of it, and we we develop some reports for them. And hopefully we'll be able to get the funding to do the DNA, too. Mm -hmm. that'd be great yeah Rebecca Casellas Rebecca's is Oklahoma for doing this I agree yeah big forward thinking step not going to solve themselves yeah and when something goes unsolved for so long you know it's worth trying something different I agree yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. But and, and but it's it's that allowing themselves to be open like that and the vulnerability to say like we we don't have the time or resources to do this mm -hmm. and just being admitting it and then it's going like you, you guys say you can help us out we trust you we'll get the paperwork in place to make sure that can happen and we'll see what we can do with it um, yeah yeah I don't see why more agencies don't don't work like this there's a few yeah. forward thinkers out there. Actually, Lee, I'm surprised you're not on the, uh, or maybe you are, on the uh, the NCA's list of experts. Mm, the, no. the, NCA, the NCA has a, <laughs> a list of non-law enforcement experts that agencies can contact to help out on on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Hmm. So I was looking into it. I just found out about it the other day. So I was looking into it and I was like, how do you, <laughs> well, get, on that? How do you get on that? What yeah, does the NCA well, stand for? National Crime Agency for the UK. Crime Agency. Yeah. Oh, yeah. for the UK. Okay. For the UK. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That sounds like that's right up your alley there, Lou. It's basically their FBI, I guess you could say. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know, it's kind of bureaucratic here. It can be quite annoying. So. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you're right. Maybe I should let them know. Or maybe I'll let them find me. I got enough to do. <laughs> <laughs> Doug, we need to come up with an other operation names. Doug and I are work working on um, some cases in uh, the, the Pacific Northwest. I guess, Alex, you are too. Yes, and I am. I, um, there's four different cases, so we got to come up with different operation names for them. Uh -huh. Like um, Operation Gray I Man, Operation, like operation, operation mm -hmm. Bigfoot. If it's Pacific Northwest, no. you got to go with Bigfoot no. on one No, we don't. No? No Bigfoot? <laughs> Oh, as a did, name, but not as an investigation, dear God. Did you go. read your email yeah. in the last uh, hour or so? I did. I did, yeah. Okay. It's moving okay. forward. Uh, but yeah, we'll do that for Oklahoma. Because yeah. some of them are linked, we can put them all under the same operation. And we'll see what emerges. Maybe we could have the the uh, detectives, citizen detectives, vote on it. Or you have to be in the there DEA. Yeah. Have them suggest <laughs> a code yeah. name for it operation name but we'll we'll get the cases and um we'll talk that's what we'll do next session we'll talk about the cases and the, which ones we're going to do and then we'll uh, come up with uh operation names for them we might even be able to call the episodes that or or have it somewhere in the tag like mm -hmm. not that Exciting. it does any good to, to do this operation thing it's <laughs> what it what it did in the um in the pacific northwest case is it allows you to think about things without without um as much bias because sure. if you're like mm -hmm. um, did this guy kill all these people then you're thinking well he he killed those people and no one else could have killed them or it's better to 
to have like a a, a more neutral signifier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Looking forward mm-hmm. to it. All right, thank you, everyone. I liked Mister yeah, Cruel Case. It was good. Yeah. 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 Okay. Finally, give me a chance to for it. Yeah, and good insights, oh. Doug. Thanks for coming on again. Anytime. Thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure. Two weeks from All right, now, everyone. Oklahoma. See you later. All right. Good, good night, night, everyone.